Folks, welcome to an all new episode of So Bad It's Good with Ryan Bailey. This is your pal Ryan, and this is your Thursday episode. We're doing a Real Housewives of Salt Lake City reunion part two recap, folks. Woo! I'm telling you, they should have released all three of these in one week. I'm getting a little testy. I'm getting a little... I need the answers to the reality Vontees. I need them to show all of their cards now. I cannot have this. You keep dragging it out. There's only so much my nervous system, my digestion can handle at this point. Are you the same? I just want... I mean, come on. Let's do the reality Vontees stuff already. Please. It's all good. But I would be... I would be so much more if I could find out what Monica's actual story is. How the heck is everybody doing out there? Are you guys good? I hope you are. Oh goodness, we're already at Thursday. Thank the good Lord. Now I gotta I gotta say right off the bat, uh listen, stay with me today. This might get really crazy, really kooky, because I do not feel well. Um uh, I've been, I didn't get good. I usually don't get good sleep anymore. Uh, I mean now for years, um, <laughs> but I had to wake up early to go do the Jeff Lewis live after show over at Sirius. And that was awesome. Did it with Justin Martindale. You can find it on the Sirius XM app. And it was a lot of fun. Um, but I was, I was just like, Oh, I'm not feeling well. I'm not feeling good. And then, um, and then I had to rush back and do an interview and like halfway through the interview, you know, like when your body signals and you're like, you are sick, sir. You are, that's how you that's how my inner voice, you are sick. And I was like, Oh no, no. And I feel like it's like, a, I feel like a flu. I don't know if it's a flu. I listen, I'm going to take the test after this. I'm going to take the damn COVID test after this. I'm praying to God. Cause I got this pounding headache and so just bear with me. But when I, when I don't feel well, and there have been, I don't worry, I can work through this. There have been multiple shows that I've, I've worked while I'm sick. You can, you know, um, so we'll get through this together. Just know that I might not be at my best or it might even be better. It might even be better. Who knows? Right. So just know that off top, um, that, uh, you know, I'm not feeling my best, but I hope you are feeling your best and I hope we can actually laugh together. Um, I want to say a couple of things up top. I want to do a couple of stories and just talk, uh, about a couple of things, um, in regards to, uh, you know what it is too. It, it, you know, my dad, my dad just left. He left yesterday. He was like, what are you here a week or so? And, uh, I think I was so stressed, not stressed. That's not the word. You know, it's always, it, it, it was really, it, it was emotional having him here. It was like the first time he was <clears throat> in LA without mom since, you know, the stuff happened with mom. And, uh, I was really nervous about it. I, and I don't mean like, I'm not nervous to be with my dad, obviously, but there's just so much emotions wrapped up into everything right now. You guys ever feel that way after like kind of a, a traumatic event, everything is kind of new. It's like the first of this or the first of that. And I was picking up on so much of my, you know, I'm an empath. <laughs> I love how everybody is an empath these days. Everybody's an empath. You're like, Oh, you might actually just care about what other people think and feel. Uh, but I was, you know, I was empathing my dad and I, I knew he was going through it and it was, it, it, it kind of intensified even my feelings about everything. And so it was, uh, it was great to have him out here. I, I miss him, but at the same time, I think it was that kind of release of once he left, I was like, oh, like this is exhale. And, and by the way, I know a couple of my dad's friends listen to this show. Hi, hello. How are you? Please don't tell my dad I'm saying any of this, please. Like I, I, I love him so much. Um, but it it was one of those things that I was really, you know, just it's like when you're you're just you're clenching the entire time um, because you hope he has a good time and you're just hoping. I don't know. Anyways, I think that's what it is. I think my body is just finally falling apart. This last month and a half has been so flipping tough. Uh, I'm sure for you guys as well. I'm not ignorant to that fact, but I've, I've not. Um, it's just weird. It's just this last year. It just it just seems like it's just been a snowball. So there's like these moments where I think my, I just get mentally, emotionally, physically exhausted. And I think I might, I think also it just might be just, I'm sick. I'm just, just, Hey, listen, that could just be it. I'm sick. Well, anyways, the point is, uh, I already recorded 20 minutes of this show. And then, uh, I looked down and I realized I had hit mute on the microphone. Uh, and then <laughs> I hit mute on the microphone, you guys. 
And that's always, that's never good. It's never good when you realize, oh no, I did not record what I just did. And it's not like it was like Pulitzer Prize winning podcasting, which do they even, can do they give out Pulitzer Prizes for podcast? Not, not important now, obviously. But then I was contacting like the help desk at the, 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 the service I used to record, I was contacting them. And then finally it's, it took like a 30 minutes for them to get back to me. And they're like, well, we're going to have to dig through this and dig through this to see if these cloud files actually might've picked up some kind of audio. And then finally I was like, you know what, just forget it. I'll, I'll just re-record. And then this is what the person writes back to me. Um, and I thought this was kind of so cute, but I was like, Cause I was like, you know what? Don't worry. I'll just re-record. And this person writes back. Certainly there is no problem at all. Exclamation point. Just ensure that you record it with confidence and have an excellent podcast. And I was like, what kind of stock email? It was so weirdly worded of just like, just record with confidence. And I was like, I will try. I will, I will try to record this with a sick confidence, sir. Um, it was, it was very cute. And I laughed. So we are re-recording this. Okay. Also, I want to uh, give uh, a couple of not warnings, but a couple of just alerts right up top on how you consume or listen to this show. Um, Now, I will tell you my opinions on what I'm seeing on screen. I always have done that. And uh, it's okay if you do not agree with those opinions, right? That's okay. Even though we, it's been proven that I'm usually right. (laughs) I'm kind of joking. And but just know that you might have completely different opinions. You do not need to get angry about it. Like it's it's okay. This is just a podcast. And secondly, secondly, it is even if you don't find it, it's meant to have a comedic bent. And this is so painful to even have to say. Um, but these things, I try to make myself laugh. I hope you guys will laugh at certain things. But that's all it is. If you don't like it, you do not have to listen to it. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of hate listens. I don't do it personally. And I, I, I hope you won't do that to yourself as well. Um, and actually just follow your own bliss and find things that you actually truly love. Because I think there's so much more power in that completely. So if you don't like recurring jokes, if you don't like voices, if you're like, this is probably not the show for you. But I do appreciate every damn person that is here listening, having a good time. I've gotten so many uh, messages the last week. I got so many great messages. This one message, this, this girl wrote, uh, said, Hey, I was listening to you a couple weeks ago. I was on the road with my friend and we were at a hotel and, and I put on your podcast to go to sleep to, which by the way, I do think this podcast is one of the best podcasts to sleep to. This truly is a good podcast to sleep to. But she said, I turned it on for my friend and we were just both in the hotel room laughing as we were going to bed. And I thought that's amazing. That's it. Exactly. It's, it's meant to be silly. It's meant to be funny. We will make some points. I mean, I'm sorry. It'll, it'll just happen accidentally, but I hope that you can have a couple of chuckles here and there because everything does seem so bleak. Everything does seem so much. So hopefully we can spend these couple of hours and get away from all of that shit and get to a place where we can probably have a smile, a laugh, and just agree that the ladies of Salt Lake are, um, They're one taco short of a combination plate. You know what I'm saying? Like it is not all there. Also, I want to get a, give a shout out to a new listener. Um, now I'm good friends, uh, with this person. She said, Hey, I, I, um, I got my friend to start listening to your show. And I was like, that's, that's amazing. We always want, and by the way, you guys do that too. Please pass this on to your friends. Please. If you think they'll dig it, uh, you know, make them listen to it, hold them down and just put like, put earphones on them and make them listen. But, uh, I want to give a shout out to a new listener, Deanne Costanzo and Deanne, I guess, lives in the mean streets of Salt Lake city where these ladies live and breathe. And I, I probably should have Deanne on at some point just to ask her if the, the Salt Lake city is just if it's just, if it's the mean streets, if there's just a lot of gangster activity, because the way these ladies portray Salt Lake City, you could lose an eye out there. You could lose an eye or uh, go to jail. I mean, that's, I mean, that has been proven at this point. So Deanne, thank you so much for listening. Hopefully you still listen. I got this message last week. So maybe in that week interim, she's like, you know what? Not for me. But if, if you're still here, Deanne, welcome Thank you for being a baddie or at least considering being a baddie. And hopefully we can laugh together. Also, please keep an eye on Meredith Mark's store for me in Park City. 
every every review I read about Meredith Mark's store, it seems like there's never jewelry in the actual store. And I think it's a jewelry store. They're always like, it has a couple of shirts that like I'm disengaging. And everybody's super excited to be like, if I went to Salt Lake City, I think it would be one of the first places I would visit. But it's very funny that it's a jewelry store and she even had a jewelry line in one of the episodes this season, yet we didn't, yet people go and there's not actual jewelry. And listen, if it was anybody other than Meredith Marks, I would say, hey, maybe they're laundering money there. But we know that's not, we know that's, and that's a joke, folks. That's a joke. Um, if you do like this show, please consider rating it five stars on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, if you want more, go to patreon.com forward slash so bad it's good. I'm going to be recording with Meditza Lopez this week. We used to do a podcast called Shooting the Shit on there. And we haven't done one in a long time because I'm very close with Meditza. So there's people you're really close to. You kind of like, you talk to them every day. So then the thought of like podcasting is like, oh, well, we talk every day anyway. So we're actually going to sit down and do another podcast this week finally together. Uh, I'll be able to catch up on everything that she's up to. Uh, I had my dad on for the Patreon Live, which you can check out on there as well. Uh, there is just a lot of odds and ends over there. But, uh, you know, if that's your thing, go check it out. Uh, and then, listen, I, uh, like I said, not feeling good. You can probably hear it. You can probably tell. But... Um, okay, so Vanderpump Rules premieres January 30th, right? We got two weeks until the premiere of season 11 of Vanderpump Rules. What's up, dude? Um, and there was the premiere party tonight at the Palladium in Los Angeles, and I was invited to it. <clears throat> now, I did not go to the premiere party. And I know Sandra, who works with me, is probably so upset that I'm not there because she was even texting. I was like sleeping all afternoon trying to feel better. And she texted, oh, have, I, I hope you have the best time ever. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm letting Sandra down by not by not going to this thing. But I even had to email Bravo, who were so nice to invite me and just say, hey, I am not. I think I'm coming out with a flu or possibly COVID. I'm scared. I didn't, I didn't say I'm scared to do a test, but I was like, I, I got it. Cause also I got this opportunity on Friday to audition for like a dream thing. Uh, um, and I want to be my best I can. So if I'm not, if I am sick, I want to be able to make sure I'm not going out like really burning the candle at both ends and being able to put this work into this show and not partying. Cause I've partied with the Vanderpump people. I, of course I would want to be there. Of course it's exciting. Of course, all of that stuff. Um, but, uh, but I will say the good news is I do have the screener for the first episode of the premiere. I'm going to watch it, um, tomorrow morning, uh, if I'm feeling good. And so I'll be able to see the premiere and it, you know, and I'll be able to give a hint to you guys of what it's like. I hear it's pretty good though. And uh, yeah, I'm bummed that I couldn't be there. So, um, and, and I, I was excited to see my friends like Emily D. Baker and Up and Adam and all of these great people that I love working with. Um, so I'm kind of bummed, but I think it was <clears throat> the right decision because I was planning on going to that anyways and then coming back and doing this recap. And I would have been up to like four or five in the morning. So lucky you guys, you get your Salt Lake City <laughs> recap. But uh, the big news was that they finally announced the official the valley so this was originally like vanderpump valley it had a lot of different names it's called the valley and it's going to be on bravo um in the spring and they showed the first look you can actually see it online today if you want to go look and uh i told you the name of this show a couple of months ago i told you it i told you that also i originally thought it was going to be on peacock but it's actually going to be on bravo after vanderpump rules i think it'll be probably be one of the last a couple last episodes of vanderpump rules and they're going to do that thing where Jax is going to be that character that takes you from vanderpump rules so there'll be a scene with jackson vanderpump rules and he'll be that bridge over into the valley now the trailer itself there's not a lot to go on it's pretty silly um it you know Jax is riding like this baby car but he puts on like a driving glove and he's like driving around the valley and we get to see the characters or some of the characters that are going to be in the valley now we do know a couple of these people Jax and Brittany we know them right and then we have Janet Elizabeth and Jason Caperna Janet Elizabeth has been on the show a bunch of times uh and she just gave birth to a beautiful baby she actually I was texting with her earlier she couldn't go to the premiere tonight um, and, uh, she knew that this was going to premiere. So I'm so excited that it, it's out. She's a great person, a really, really, and al always a really big supporter of mine in the show. Um, so I'm excited to see what that's like. And then of course you have Kristen Doty. Kristen Doty is at the very end of the trailer and she has her trash, like a trash bag, like she's taking out the trash and Luke, her dude is with her. 
And then a couple, I think two other couples that I'm not sure exactly who they are yet. You can't really tell anything from the trailer because it's shot just for the trailer. There's no scenes from the actual show. So I really don't have a, I don't really have anything to go on. The trailer itself, it's silly, but I feel like with the negativity that goes around uh, Bravo circles a lot of the times, myself included, that this thing will potentially get ripped on. And I'm going to wait until I see the show. But Jax, I mean, it really kind of hinges for me on Jax Taylor and his quote unquote performance. Which Jax are we going to get? Are we going to get the real Jax or are we going to get the Jax that's like, listen, I played a villain on the show, but that's just a character I play. Like, are we going to get real Jax Taylor or are we going to get Jax Taylor that think like it's like, like, oh, I'm actually playing a character, but it's not uh, I'm saying that it's character, but it's actually me. Like, I'm, I'm wondering and I'm just scared at the end of the day. And I've told you this before that Jax is just going to screw up his entire great family that he's built for a chance to be on TV again. And that's the one thing we can blame Scandable on. We can blame it for many things, um, you know, ruining lightning bolts, uh, bad hairstyles, karaoke bands, and the return of ancient evils like Jax Taylor. We open the floodgates and Jax Taylor is back in, baby. So it's going to hinge on his performance, I think. The show really is going to be on his shoulders. And Jax is one of those wild card people. Like he can be wildly entertaining to watch, but then he can be completely frustrating. It depends on how real he decides to be. And I feel like if he decides to be really real, that could actually be bad for his real life. You guys, you, you understand what I'm saying. So I'm really curious, but the trailer itself doesn't give us any kind of glimpse into what it is. It's kind of like a cheesy joke about Jack's driving a baby car around the valley and waving to these other couples. Um, like, listen, are we going to see swingers? Are we going to see key parties? What are we doing with these families? How are we growing up in the valley? Um, so we'll see, but uh, I'm glad we finally got our first look at that, but that will be in the spring. So that is something to look forward to. Um, also, uh, Raquel goes rogue or Rachel goes rogue, her podcast that I did a full recap of the first episode. Well, the second episode came out and it's so funny reading other people's feedback from that first episode. Cause they're like, Oh my God, she talks so slow, but you saw, I listened to it at like 1.75 speed. So for me, I was like, it was the right tempo. So I like, I didn't even bother trying at normal speed because I knew it was going to be too slow. So that was the big thing of like, this girl is so slow. But if you listen at 1.75, I was like, okay, this is a good pace. This is nice. But it is what I fear is that you got a couple pieces of information, um, but it, uh, you know, and basically the big piece of information that's going around right now is that Schwartz knew immediately after the first night she hooked up with Tom in Tom and Ariana's pool in the Valley. Um, so that's the big thing. And, you know, like we all knew that we all knew that Schwartz knew from the beginning. We also all knew that Schwartz was going to protect his best or be one of his best friends, Tom. But I do think it is funny. This boys club, this boys brought this brotherhood of dorks. Um, uh, that they do protect each other. They do, you know, like I've always held true to the fact that Jack Schwartz and Sandoval have probably all cheated so many times and they've kept so many secrets for each other that it's like, you know, to the grave, they would keep these secrets because they all have extreme dirt on each other. Like each one of those dudes, like I used to think Sandoval was completely clean, but we know now that's not true. So I think that was a part of that anger that you would always see from Jax of like, oh, everybody thinks he's so good, but I know he's not. I know like he really probably has real facts to back that up even though it is funny that Jax did change his tune once the valley started filming he was like come on you guys it's enough tom's a good guy i like him now i like him oh my god can you believe we're gonna start recapping vanderpump rules in a couple of weeks are you guys ready for that are you guys vanderpump exhausted or will you still be here to listen to my recaps for that i was even trying to think about that myself like how exhausted am i of vanderpump because i was seeing the premiere photos of people walking into that vanderpump premiere and sandoval fucking wore a lightning bolt necklace he was like and i love it for like this is a big statement for tom of like dude i'm taking it back dude a lightning bolt has always meant something to me dude it's not about me and rachel dude it's about me i've always loved lightning bolts and i just think like dude just don't wear the lightning bolts Come on, man. Like, not everything has to be a defense of your actions. Not everything has to be like, I'm still standing in my power. I'm still standing in my light, dude. 
It's like, come on, man. Also, is the more of Rachel's story that actually comes out, you realize that, you know, he just, he wasn't that, yeah, it, there's not a lot of redeeming things when it comes to that story in particular. And I just hope that he can actually get away from that and not turn it into, well, now I'm angry at everybody else. Like he's always had this kind of low level anger at all of us for reacting so strongly. And even though he loved the popularity of it and what it's done for him in certain ways, he still doesn't love that he turned into a pseudo villain. And that's why I think you're going to try, you're going to get a real big push for a redemption season with Tom and the other thing that is funny is he's not really even in the first episode because he is filming uh, Special Forces on that first episode of Vanderpump Rules season 11. So it is going to be a really interesting season because I, I, I've kept like I've actually stayed away from spoilers. I've asked people not to tell me. Um, in fact, I was texting with a couple of the cast members tonight and I was texting with Sheena earlier. And I just don't want to know. I want to be surprised. I want to, I'm, I'm excited to see what story the producers are trying to tell and w how we're going to respond to that as an audience. And I think a lot of people really have, you know, the cast, I think has there, they've come to terms with Tom in a lot of ways, not Ariana, but a lot of the cast. And then I think a lot of the audience, I see it, you know, it's like, Oh, I love Tom. I love Tom. So it is interesting. Like that price you have to pay lasts about what, like six or seven months. But you have to realize he got, he got a lot of things from that too. He got a lot of opportunities, just like a lot of the rest of them. So that's all going to be interesting. So, okay, that's it. Who I am feeling hot. I am I, what are you, that. That's probably a fever. That's what that is. Okay. Uh, also, I want to thank Laura Beth Harp who took these notes. She's amazing. Uh, this the note she took also are for, is from the Peacock's Peacock extended version where they're able to say things like beep and doop and beep no they're able to say like fucking shit and like you know like they're able so it's like it's worth the money for peacock because you can see the new the traders which i love but then also they use the dirty curse words and there is something very powerful about lisa barlow going like you fucking bitch <laughs> it's like you realize like i kept going like i was like oh my god these are like real potty mouths like real potty mouths it's like wash your mouth out with soap and it's for some like lisa because monica and lisa love to like just curse at each other and I get it from Monica. That seems like to be her, her default. But Lisa, I mean, Lisa, you are a godly woman. Like Lisa, why are you saying these words? You are better than this. And you are just throwing out curse word after curse word. And I think when they beep it out, when I watch the Bravo version, I just don't really think about it that much. But when you watch the actual Peacock with the thing, you're like, damn, what, what, what is this? Deaf comedy jam? Like, what is it? What? I mean, this is Andrew Dice Clay. It's wild. Like you're like, Hickory dickory dog. The, the preacher went over the. <laughs> That's an Andrew Dice Clay reference. Uh, people that are over 35 will get that. Uh, they probably still won't find that funny, but they'll get it. Um, so let's uh, let's see where we are this week with these ladies. Uh, what did you think of the second part? I just I'm really frustrated because I just want it all now. Like I said earlier, I want everything Right now, I think we deserve to have the final third part now. Like, I want to, this is all leading up to Reality Montees. I mean, we ended the finale, we ended with one of the most dramatic moments in Bravo history. I mean, it was so good. I mean, that was amazing. That's how we ended the season and now we're two episodes into the reunion and i want to see the screenshots the the the, the timeline i don't want to hear any more of heather gay's audio recordings from her phone that she got from tanisha i want them to paint a picture i want people to break it down like i'm in a murder mystery i want them i want them to treat me like i'm stupid like walk me in like hand to hand and take me through everything also the other thing that you noticed watching this is that heather gay uh, has filled in definitely Lisa Barlow because Lisa Barlow is like, play the tape, play a Monica. Would you ever say things about Mary Cosby? And like, so, so Lisa obviously knows everything that Heather has. And I think there is something dangerous when you have a little, little bit of a sewing circle where they're all teaming up against one person. Like, I understand it, but at the same time, you know, it's dangerous for that group because you can sometimes end up turning that person into a martyr and it will actually do the opposite of what you're trying to do. 
at this point, Monica doesn't have tons of legs to stand on. But what I will say is the show or the reunion, at least, gives a lot of a lot of reason on why Monica is the way she is. And that's the thing, the case they're trying to build. You saw it all season, but it's even really hit over the head at the reunion where we're delving into her family life. We're delving into her mom, her marriage, her dad leaving, all of these things. And you might laugh and you might say, oh, well, that's just somebody trying to make somebody feel bad for something or trying to make somebody feel bad for, the, you know, that person. But you, you got to go. But those are real things. And those do affect somebody's mental state. Now, none of what Monica did is right. Like I, I was reading something that somebody sent me where, and they kind of allude to it at the very end that she had access to Jen Shaw's cameras at her house and would spy on Jen. And like, that's just obviously, like, that's obviously so messed up. That's so horrible. No matter if you are thinking you're a crime fighter and going up against Jen to battle what she did to, uh, you know, by bilking money out of seniors, it still is not right. It still has crossed a complete boundary. So, but you do have to say that if all of these things happen, if her mother is the way that we all think that her mother is, then of course you're going to grow up treating other people differently. You're going to fight at the drop of a hat. I mean, we see her mom, Linda, LD millionaire on Twitter, curse at Monica in many scenes. And you're like, of course, Monica has a potty mouth. That's where she learned it from. Of course, these things usually just don't invent themselves. They are created. There's an origin story for how people behave. And also, I want to, you know, we shared this at the end of last week's reunion where Monica last week had come out and said about her marriage and how she was uh, in trigger warning, talking about assault. You know, her her ex-husband assaulted her in front of her kids. And like I said, you know, that's a big, that's a bold accusation to put out there. And I don't think she would do it unless it was true, because with that kind of stuff, there is paperwork. And there was we somebody did find a police report where her ex-husband did slap her in front of the children and the police did come. So that actually was proven. Um, so all of these things do affect a psyche. Like I said, it doesn't excuse the behavior. Um, but I think what it is and you see a lot of this in online behavior as well as the show is that it. I think sometimes people forget that these are real people like, you know, even the castmates, I said, sometimes the castmates forget that they're all actual people living lives and they like treat it like a murder mystery. Heather was building a case. And that's why I think Heather knew from the beginning of the season, I think Heather built a case over a long period of time or had information at her disposal in case Monica got uppity. You know, I do think that I think she built an actual case. And I think sometimes you get caught up in the game that Housewives has turned into. On the Jeff Lewis After Show today, we were talking about that, or I think Alyssa mentioned, uh, you know, the Housewives have turned into a game. Because we were talking about how much we love the traders on Peacock, which is kind of a reality competition show. And somebody was like, well, you know, the Housewives isn't like that. I'm like, no, the Housewives is exactly like that. It is a competi competition. Who's going to survive the season? Who's going to get asked back? You don't think Tamara goes into every season thinking it's a competition? What show are you watching if you don't think that? I mean, it's completely a competition. So I think all of these ladies, they want to have fun and they want to have a sisterhood. But at the same time, they're trying to win, man. They are trying to win that season. They're trying to win our hearts, our affection. They're trying to win Andy's affections. They're trying to get asked back for another season. They're all trying to go after the same brand deals. That has got to be pretty intense. But you even see it with the fandom, right? I think sometimes I saw this brilliant TikTok. I forgot who the lady who did it was, um, but it was like, some of the fans, just amazing, amazing fans. Like a lot of my listeners, just amazing, like really well thought out, really kind of funny, you know, all this stuff. But then you see the fans that th they think they're in the show. Like they treat their lives like they're in a reality show. They want to create mess. They want to fuck it up. They want to throw themselves into. And it's like, dude, just audition for a reality show. Take this offline and just go do, go follow that blitz. Go be that reality star. But they, you know, you just tell them, you're like, oh my God, your lives. Like, you know, and sometimes you picture them like where they probably have really normal lives. And then they have this whole secret online life where they are just a monster and they are just collecting dirt and trying, like they treat everything like a reality show. That's like psychotic behavior. It's kind of like starting a podcast. <laughs> um, okay. That's just a quick, wow. I really am not feeling. Good. 
Am I making sense so far? Let me tell you, this is what I love about unicorns. There's a unicorn on my left and a unicorn on my right. And I think they're both beautiful and they both watch Salt Lake with me tonight. And I just, I think it's awesome. You want to say anything, Randy? Um, this, <laughs> this is Real Housewives of Salt Lake City Reunion Part 2. Uh, this is this description the cable company gives <laughs> gives. In part two, of the, <laughs> sorry, I watched Beverly Hills tonight and uh, I keep laughing about the recap we did last week where uh, Freddie Mellencamp showed up and Freddie was talking about her big knuckles. And I think I called her Freddie Fat Knuckles or Freddie Fat Fingers or something like that. <laughs> I keep thinking about it, Freddie Fat Knuckles. <laughs> When Morgan and Kyle are feeding each other fruit. Oh my God. I can't wait to talk about the Beverly Hills episode. I hope I feel up to it tomorrow because they're, I mean, it's not cohesive like Salt Lake is, but there's so many little moments like Mo, Mo came back into town and you can just tell that Kyle wants nothing to do with Mo. Like I just picture Kyle thinking about Morgan Wade every time she's in a scene with Mo. I'm like, ah, Morgan would be way cooler to be in this limo with. Like she just, like you can just tell she is so checked out of that relationship and homeless not toothless we had the, the annual homeless not toothless and the the pop singer taylor dane from the 80s played and i love how excited the ladies of beverly hills or some of them at least get excited for these performances because last year at the homeless not toothless it was when kyle remember when melissa etheridge came out and kyle literally shit herself she was like no and melissa was like come to my window and i mean it was <laughs> looking back i don't know it's just what a show and they go to spain next week you guys they're in espana so this is the description the cable company gives us about this in part two of the reunion monica breaks down while reflecting on her relationship with her mother the rift between angie and monica grows as they disagree about the unseen events and then they just write the group is joined by mary it's such a the group is joined the group is joined by mary the group is joined by mary we get Andy in the voiceover tonight, part two with the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City reunion. And we see clips of all the stuff that we are going to be able to see in this part two episode. Okay. And also, if you're watching on YouTube, do you notice why is this ear, my right ear, completely red and this ear is not? What is going on? I've come down with a case of the red ear. Um, okay, so we see a, a collection of scenes from tonight's episode, and Andy's like, did someone get thrown down a staircase or something? And Monica's like, I went to grab the railing. There was no railing, and I just, and Angie K coming in hard and goes, but then you threatened to sue me. And Monica's like, I had a conversation with Meredith. She said, do you want her house? You could take her house. And Heather's like, Meredith, did you say that? And Whitney, in another scene, is like, you relentlessly came after me for supporting Jack in the mission, and you called me a hypocrite over it. And Heather's like, ah. Uh. And then we see Mary Cosby coming out, and Andy's like, Mary M. And Mary's like, hi. And Andy K's like, look who's here. And then Mary trips on, like, fake snow in the weird-looking set. And Mary's like, ooh, I'm okay. And a stagehand's like, yep, yeah, you are. And Lisa's like, Mary, Mary down. <laughs> Mary down. By the way, Monica, like, trip down Angie K steps. Monica should literally try to fall on this set and take Bravo for everything that they have. I'm joking, Bravo. And then we have a scene where Mary's like, Heather, I did like you until I seen your interview. You start talking about my house, like, saying, this is gonna, it is, you know, you get to tour Mary's house and, like, making fun. And Andy's like, you called Heather inbred to Mary. And Whitney's face, by the way, Whitney... Whitney gets a hard time, and I don't understand it a lot of the times, but Whitney, her facial reactions in part two especially, it's a lot of like zoiks, a lot of eye movement, really good silent film acting here. And uh, then we have a scene of Andy going, what do you think of what the women discovered about Monica? And Mary's like, I have no idea who the troll account is. And Lisa's like, would you care if that account called you a dumb bitch? <laughs> so Lisa, like I said, fully is aware of everything that Heather Heather's holding all the cards and Lisa knows everything as well. And she, Lisa tells Monica, you called Mary a dumb bitch. That's why you're speaking up. And Monica's like, no one called. And Lisa to Heather goes, get the audio. And Monica's like, no, I'm saying. And Lisa to Mary's like, she called you a dumb bitch. And Monica's like, you've never called someone a dumb bitch, Lisa. 
Now, the title card comes on the screen, and then we pick up right where we left off last week, and that was where Angie K was coming alive, saying, like, you got a shitty car and a carport, like, really coming at it with that kind of Greek energy um, that we know and we love. And, yes, I am going to keep making that Greek joke until it – I'm going to keep making the Greek joke until the end of time. Um so Angie K is on fire. I just also want to point out, I, there are things about this set, like new things reveal themselves about this set that they've constructed each week. Like, I think I was so overwhelmed by the set at first. And what it reminds me of now, it reminds me of, like, I did a high school production of Pirates of Penzance. And it was like trying to have like a boat on stage and then an island. And it was just all too much. But it was high school theater. What do you expect? It reminds me of a high school musical movie theater set there's like a waiting to guffman element about this set but then the thing that cracked me up that i can't believe i didn't notice last week there's literal fake icicles hanging off of like one of the signs there's like icicles that i was like oh my god wouldn't it be amazing if one of those cracked off and just like (laughs) just the middle of somebody going like just a whole hog and then just like a fake icicle cracks like it is they have fake icicles on the set like how did we get here Okay, so Angie K is picking up. She's like, bitch, I deserve to be here with your fucking Range Rover under a fucking carport. And this is where I was like, thank you, Peacock. Really excited to hear Angie say fucking. And she's like, spending your kid's money on a fucking purse? You're irresponsible. And Andy's like, all right. And Monica's like, are you insane? And Angie K's like, and you're sending a bad message to your daughter. And Monica's like, keep my fucking kids out of your fucking mouth, you piece of shit. And Angie K's like, Fuck off, bitch. I'm Greek. You talked about mine. And Monica's like, you fucking. And Angie Kay's like, fuck off. Nobody wants you here. And Monica's like, no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very well aware. And then Andy goes, Andy goes, so. Okay. So this is really intense, right? And you're like, oh my God, how are we going to even come back from this? And all of a sudden, Queen Meredith speaks up and she goes, she goes, is there any way to make it a little warmer? It's. So cold, Andy. And she's like, she's like dying. She's wanting to wait. She's like dying. Give Meredith a damn bath. Let Meredith do this reunion from a bathtub. Like, I am truly thinking that she's some sort of mermaid. Like, I mean, what is it? Like, this intense fight, if fighting is happening, what you think would like warm everybody up, just the yelling of the curse words. And Meredith goes, Is there any way to make it a little warmer? Who's in charge of the thermostat around here? This is just crazy. It's so cold. It's, it's, I'm so, look at poor Whitney. I can see her booby. Like, the nipples are. Are very hard, Andy. And Whitney just goes, yeah. And Andy goes, okay, yeah. Um, can we make it a little warmer in here? Okay, let's move on. I'm like, how do we move on? Andy K just exploded on Monica, but Andy does it. He goes, well, in the housewives universe, we've been scuffling sisters, clashing cousins, and a very controversial step-grandfather. I love when we make jokes about people marrying their step-granddad. It's like, it is like a, it's a soulful laugh. Uh, he goes, but one of the most dramatic family dynamics we have seen was between Monica and her mom, Linda. Let's take a look at their rocky road this season. And we see the clip package of Monica and her mom. And I don't care what you think of Monica at this point, but I just, I, everybody has to admit this is a very bad, toxic relationship. This is bad, no matter how you want to cut it. This isn't for the cameras. Like, even when they're trying to play nice, you can sense there is a dark history here. So we see a collection of scenes, Monica and Linda at the old folks home with, you know, trying with remember Linda's mom and Linda calling her a fucking bitch there. And then Monica in a confessional going, the only thing that I can count on with my mom is that there's nothing to count on with my mom. And then another scene when Monica's over at uh, Greek Easter over at Angie Kay's house. And we had that Monica versus Linda where Linda tells Monica to stop it, stop it right now. And kind of laughs at Monica and Monica's like, you are heartless and you've got to find your own way home dead ass. And then a scene with Heather and Monica and she's talking about her mom. And she says, you know, when she turned 12, her mom, Linda dropped her off in Pennsylvania and went to New York city to pursue her dreams. Imagine that dropping them off with like dropping your 12 year old, you know, who is becoming a young adult in Pennsylvania with relative strangers while they go pursue their dreams in the big apple. That is messed up, you guys. And then we see Linda and Monica fighting again. Uh, Monica trying to discuss her trauma and Linda going, I don't care. And then calls Monica, a mo- stop being a motherfucker. And that's what I'm telling. That's the language right there. They also have 
what's really cool about the this one, they have reaction screens at the very bottom left hand corner. So you see the ladies reacting to the clip package, which I love a good reaction screen. It takes me back also to uh, the Vanderpump Rules season 10 reunion when they had Sheena and then Rachel in that trailer, the, the little trailer van 100 yards away. And you had like Sheena cam or Rachel cam. And I love, I mean, I, I would vote for like Peacock versions of just reaction cams. I love it. Um, in Bermuda, then we see a scene where Monica says she's going to see her extended family for the first time in 30 years, but then she finds out that they refuse to see her. And we have that scene in the bathroom with her and Lisa, where Lisa's like, what happened? What happened? What happened? When Lisa gets excited, she doesn't finish her words. So it's like, what happened? What happened? What happened? And Andy sees this and he goes, all right, a lot to unpack there. <laughs> like you think it was so heartbreaking seeing that happen in Bermuda. Did you get to the bottom of what happened there? Was it your mom's involvement that caused your family to cancel on you? And Monica's like, you know, this is still an unsolved mystery because my mother and I are not speaking. And Andy goes, right. <laughs> I will, you know, I, you know, I love Andy Cohen. I love him so much. I really do love this man. Um, but I love also like how, just think about how many times we've heard Andy Cohen say right at a reunion. Like that's as he goes, right, right. He says it so many times, right. Uh, and then he goes, how long has it been since you haven't spoken? And she's like, well, since filming wrapped. And Andy's like, since filming's wrapped, uh, right, right. And your family didn't give you a straight answer why they wouldn't come. And Monica's like, no. So my mom had messaged production and before we all went to Bermuda and she said, I want to go. And Andy goes, okay. And Monica's like, and production said no. And Andy goes, right. So Monica goes, so she was very pissed. She felt like I'm the one that should be there. And the family remembers me more. So she threw a huge fit. And I was like, did she do this? Cause she was mad at me that she didn't get to come. And Andy goes, guess what? Say it with me. Right. And then Monica's like, so, and Andy goes, wow. Okay. Well, Shelby from Raleigh says, Monica, your relationship with your mom is toxic AF. You said that when you went to therapy together, your mom pretended to be a different person. Why would she do that? And Monica goes, you know, I don't know. I kind of actually feel like maybe that's a little common. Like when you go to therapy and Andy's like, yeah, you try to present yourself. And Monica's like, yeah, yeah. And Andy's like, yeah. And Monica's like, but that, you know, I think we kind of see it play out this season where if I say a traumatic event, all she does is, you know, no, it wasn't, or it didn't happen like that, or it was one time, or you this, you that. And Andy goes, right. Yeah, we saw that. We saw her respond to you that way. And Monica's like, yeah. We get another flashback right here, but also I want to have a suggestion. When Monica was telling that story about her mom in Bermuda and saying she emailed production, this is the thing. Like, I know if we're breaking the fourth wall, if we're talking about production, like I want somebody, I want a representative from production to come out and been like, Hey, can we get Bobby from production? Hey, Bobby, what was your impression of Linda? Did you have these email conversations with Linda? Was she asking to go to Bermuda? Because at this point, Monica's credibility is in the sewer. Like I, you know, I still am okay with Monica. You know, I, I don't think any of these women have a lot of legs to stand on. Monica, obviously queen baddie this season, but uh, I do want to know if Monica is telling the full truth about her mom. I want to know what production thinks of her mom, because when those cameras go down, what did they notice about Linda? Like, did Linda actually curse uh, when she had to get an Uber out uh, outside of Greek Easter when when Monica left her? Like, I want somebody from production to let us know the skinny. You know, I think that would be good for us if they're going to talk about it. I want to know if it's true. They showed Monica's casting email last week. Why can't we see this? So the flashback, Monica with her mom, Monica's like, you treat me like I'm still that little tiny girl that you can fucking shit on and leave here and leave there and get your dream job and your dates. I'll sit back in the trunk of a car while you make out with one of your fucking boy toys. And Linda's like, that happened one time. <laughs> you know, one time is usually all it takes. <laughs> you know, Like the one time probably really set a mental picture for her. And Andy's like, it's almost like gaslighting. And Monica's like, yeah. And then he goes, when the women threw a birthday brunch for you in Bermuda, you cried and said it was your best birthday yet. Was that up to the point true? And uh, Monica nods her head. And part of me now, like I said, Monica is suspicious and everything now. So part of me was like, oh, come on. That really couldn't have been your best birthday. Like, really? Like, I mean, and, and if it was your best birthday, it probably just was the fact that you're like, OK, at least I'm on TV. Because think about it. If she really, truly was scared of where her life was going, has all these kids, failed marriage, all of this stuff. Um, it must be kind of exciting that like, okay, well, maybe this is the start of something really solid. Maybe I am going to be a pseudo celebrity, a reality star. So was that why it was your best birthday? Cause there's something that I just don't buy because I'm sure there were birthdays, like some birthday in your entire life had to have been better than Heather Gay stringing a couple party city balloons 
around a back patio and while you're having like Greek yogurt and pancakes and Bermuda. I mean, it's nice, but it, you know what I'm saying? Anyways, Andy's like, your dad left when you were four. Is that right? Do you hear from him? And she's like, no. And she says, the last time my mom said she saw him was at our house and he wanted us to move to Florida. She didn't want to move to Florida. And she said, I'm not leaving Boston. And apparently he walked out the door and just, I don't know. And Andy's like, and you haven't heard from him. And Monica's like, no. And honestly, I don't even know if at this age I would want to meet him. And she starts choking up here. And she's like, it's so weird, but I would like to know what he looks like at least. And listen, this is another part that, I mean, I feel so bad, but Monica just has me questioning everything about her where I was like, Monica, you seem to be very good at the internet. I feel like you could find a picture of your dad at this point. Like a quick Google search could probably just knock that wish right out of the park. And Andy goes, so when you were 12, your mom left. What career did your mom go pursue when she left you in Pennsylvania? And Monica goes, television. And Andy goes, well, she got on TV. And Andy goes, how do you feel about your mom tweeting about the show every week? And we see LD Millionaire as her Twitter handle. We see screen screenshots of some of the tweets where she's like, Monica begged me to do this reality show with her. She did me dirty. And my behavior at the dinner was abhorrent. I'm sorry. I was unpacking 16 years of bullying and manipulation by Monica. And another one, I'm not a monster. Monica is a provocateur who pushes your buttons and breaks you down, then cries. I forgive her. That's a lot. Like, She's a horrible person, but I have forgiven her. There is a lot there. And it really is. If you're, te if, you, if you're talking about abhorrent behavior, I think it begins and ends right here with LD Millionaire. I'm sorry, mom. This shows you kind of what a poor example of a mom you've been, that you really did things like, you know, leave your daughter at 12 years old to go pursue your dream. You're literally telling people online how horrible your daughter is, you know, like, what are you defending yourself for? Like, are like, who, what do you care about what we all think? Like, what does it really do your soul good to bash your daughter online on Twitter for what, for what? And he goes, she's retweeting kind of insults about you. Uh, it's gotta be rough. And Monica goes, it's honestly worse than I could have imagined. And you know, this is kind of like a little bit of a karma in, in a way as well. Right. So I'm saying that I still am of the mind that she could be on next season. And I don't know if I would horribly mind it. I mean, I know a lot of people are so vehemently against it, but I think we are seeing Monica suffer in ways because of her behavior. The reality of aunties, she has her own mom tweeting shit about her, retweeting insults about her. Shit comes back around all the time, right? And if we truly believe that, it's going to keep happening. And for the sake of reality TV, this experiment that this great show is, wouldn't you rather have your eyes on that? And also, my other thing is, do you believe in forgiveness? I've asked this question so many times on this show. Do you believe in forgiveness? Do you believe in making amends? And if you don't, what are we doing here? The purpose isn't just to hate, 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 destroy. I mean, that's good sometimes and it makes for good seasons. But at the end of the day, I think what gives it emotional gravity and weight is that there can be resolution. And we do see it on these shows. We see these things that you can never, even let's take Lisa Barlow and Meredith. They have called, you know, Lisa, you fucked half of New York. You and your fake fucking family who poses. Like, listen, I thought that monologue that Lisa Barlow do, there is no coming back from that, except that there is. There is these shows. You can come back from this. And I think that is just, truly magical about these shows and i don't even understand it because sometimes i'll get into a fight with somebody and i won't talk them i just it's done i'm a, i guess i'm a tourist that way um Mary can go f herself i'm done with her because i'm not a f whore and i don't cheat on my husband her and her dumb family that poses why don't you own a house wait you can't because your husband changes jobs every five minutes they can marry anything's a piece of i have your back and i'm offended by that f you that fucking piece of I hate her. She's a whore. She's half of New York. She's gonna f herself. Wow. I mean, literally, my nipples could cut glass right now. So excited. That is just a magical moment. But if you heard somebody say that about you, uh, first off, horrible, and you'd be done. Then also, you add on top of that, that's on national television, right? That, like, whoa, holy shit. But yet, these shows, you find that relationships can be repaired. And with the Monica Lisa, or the, the Lisa Meredith thing, it's almost even weirder because I don't really truly know how they repaired it. It's like Meredith just took some kind of weird serum and woke up and was like, I guess uh, I am feeling 
the right climate to be able to forgive Lisa Barlow. So that's okay as well. You know, like it's wild, but I do believe, or I want to believe that forgiveness can happen, that people can work their way out of holes, that people actually can be made aware of their behavior and course correct. I want to believe that. Maybe I'm just completely complete idiot, which is, I've been told that many times. Um, so Monica goes, yeah, I knew that filming was going to be hard. And I knew that you guys were going to see some of the shit because that is our relationship. But what my mom has done after online is just worse. And Andy's like, yeah, Lisa, I'm curious. You went pretty hard on Monica and you two went at each other about her relationship with her mom and about her calling her mom Ted Bundy. And we get a flashback where my, Monica's like, my mom was very, very charming. And so was Ted Bundy. And Lisa's like, maybe you're more like your mom than you think you are. Maybe you're the exact same person. Andy in the reunion goes, watching the show, did it make you rethink how you approached her about her mom? And then Lisa goes, this is like a two-part question. <laughs> I love Lisa Marlowe. Lisa goes, so what I observed on the Easter was Monica's mom being lovely and charming. And I said that statement based off what I saw, not off of the history. And by the way, Lisa is right here as well, because that's all we can do as people, right? Is judge what we see, judge how we are treated by that person. So why would Lisa know this deep history of Monica and her mom? So of course, that's what we, Lisa is not wrong here. That is what she was going off of. It is wild though. I love the people that will, um, uh, take somebody else's opinion about somebody else, just hook, line and sinker of like, Oh, I don't like that person either. I'm like, have you, has that person been good to you? Yeah. But you're just going to just, okay, that's what I find that wild. Like, it's like, uh, anyways, uh, Monica goes, I also said that I don't live in their house. I don't know what happens behind closed doors. You know, fast forward, like actually watching the show and like they, oh, sorry, this is Lisa saying this. They have a very tumultuous relationship. It's sad. And it's really none of my business. <laughs> Lisa says at the end and Monica's like, well, I appreciate that. I agree that from the outside perspective, it would look like I'm just a complete bitch to my mom. I think that unless you do know about our history, or even if you've dealt with it yourself, I feel like you can kind of see what she was doing. It was more important to my mother to impress everyone else than to be there for her daughter. And Whitney's like, I saw that. I me, Whitney, I saw that. And Heather's like, she impressed us. And Whitney's like, she sat down at the table and I felt like she wanted to be in Monica's shoes. And Andy's like, well, I was just going to say, I mean, for someone who left her 12 year old to go pursue a career in television. And Whitney's like, yeah, it's gross. And Andy goes, do we think your mom was kind of auditioning to be a housewife a little bit? And Monica's like, well, when I applied to get on the show, I did my final interview. And the first place I went after was to my mom's. And I just laid on her couch and I cried. And I was like, I totally effed up. Like I totally bombed it. I don't feel like I was myself. And my mom said, let's say a prayer. And then she prayed that she would get it instead. She literally said, Lord, if it's not Monica, let it be me. Somehow just let it be me instead. And Whitney's like, oh my God. And Andy mouths, wow. And we get a commercial break. We come back and Monica's like, so, but by the way, this is another scene that I find it so hard to believe, even though I know it's probably true. And that's why it is wild. And probably how Monica has turned out the way she has, but like, just a mat. And also imagine praying to God, God, exi okay. If God exists and God's just getting, you know, we're talking billions of prayers a day. And he's like, okay, let's, uh, let's see what's going on in Salt Lake there. And, uh, we're like, okay. We got LD millionaire giving me a prayer. Wait, what? She's praying to be on a fucking reality show. Are you fucking kidding me? Do you know how much I've got going on up here? It's an election year and you're asking to be on a fucking reality show because your daughter fucked up her final interview. Are you fuck? Oh my God. Why am I cursing? I'm God. I'm Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I just think like, this is what we're praying for. Let it be me instead. Like, I just find that so wild to even believe, but I kind of believe it. Heather goes, and you still filmed with your mom after that? Why risk that? And Monica's like, honestly, that's a fair question. I think I'm so used to it. And Andy's like, yeah, you are, that it just feels normal. And Andy's like, normal, it does. Has she always had a habit of sabotaging you when you've had success? And I also want to speak to what Monica just said is that sometimes when you're in a pattern of behavior with somebody else and you're so indoctrinated in that, you know, they do this with religion as well, that you just don't think it just, you, it's, you don't realize it's wrong. You don't realize that it's bad. You don't, you know, you, you know, it makes you feel bad, but you're like, well, I guess that's just what life is. You just go along with it. You know, you don't like most people in their lives. Think about it. Most people in their lives don't stand up for themselves or they learn to do it later in life where they started their life being really ballsy and standing up for themselves. And that got beaten out of them at some point. Um, so I do actually find a world in which like, of course, like 
I mean, that's something I've had to deal with even, even myself of like, you know, people that I know have giant red flags that I continue to be nice to when I shouldn't have, when I just shouldn't have. And I, I, people warn me all this, you know, like, but I continue to be nice. And you just, you know, because I was like, no, no, you know, you're always making excuses for that person. And then at the end of the day, you know, it's like, you realize you do got to go with that gut feeling. You do got to do that, but you're always trying to make excuses. You're always trying to like, oh no, this person, it's okay. This is the reason this is you make excuses for people, especially family. Um, so uh, Monica's like, yeah, you know, when I actually first dated da dating my ex, I was like in love right away. And uh, by the way, the whole time Monica's talking, Meredith is like brushing her long hair with her hands away. She's like, I'm just I'm petting my hair. I'm just just kind of situating my beautiful hair and just so warm in here now. And Monica's like, and he came to my house and she saw how happy I was. And Andy's like, I'm scared to hear this. And then she banned him from ever being able to visit the house again. And she said, you will not take my daughter away from me. And Andy's like, wow. And Monica's like, you are not welcome here. So I just think my mom, uh, I don't know. And when he's like, until you have the opportunity to like see it from the outside looking in, you have no idea how much you're being manipulated and abused and how toxic it is until you have a chance to view it. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. You get some distance on it and you're like, what the fuck was I thinking? And you almost feel ashamed then and beat yourself up even more because you can't believe that you let you thought, Oh, I thought I was a smart person. And you, how, how could I have not have seen this? How could I have been so my vision clouded over? Like it is wild. It is just wild, you know, but distance does help you see. And Heather goes, yeah, amen to that. And Whitney's like, and you know, even with my own father, Monica, it took watching for certain things to trigger in my brain. And Andy's like, that you can't accept this. Yeah. And by the way, remember Whitney filmed with her father that first season? And obviously, uh, Whitney and her husband, Justin, went through so much with her father in terms of rehabs, helping them. And there was obviously, you know, and I hate to say this about somebody's parent, but obviously there was a, an amount of using going on of her father and using Whitney and her husband for certain things. And so I know a lot of people are like, oh, what happened to Whitney's father? Why isn't he back? I think I was even one of those people at that point at one point. But it's like, yeah, this is probably best for Whitney to not have her dad on. Um, and he goes, Heather, you have a complicated relationship with your mom. Are the two of you speaking these days? And she goes, just birthday text, Christmas text. Um, I knew the conditions of my family if I were to do the show and leave the church. So Heather says, knowing going into the show, she knew what the end result would be. And it's wild. She chose this over family. And I will say, listening to Heather's book, did you realize Heather had a book? It's called Bad Mormon. I just heard about this last week. Uh, first time she mentioned it on the show. And she said, uh, she was talking about this. And I just, uh, in the book, you know, it's another person where I always talk about the, 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 you know, people being enamored with television or movies or what we see on screens that are not in our real lives, our phones, our watches, you know, we see these little screens and we think they're magic. We think there's some kind of, you know, like, holy shit. It's a, it's, it's witchcraft, you know? And, and then the possibility of being able to be that on your, you know, for yourself, being able to put yourself on that screen, there is something really alluring about that. And I found it weird for Heather to kind of admit, yeah, like I did show, I knew what I was getting into doing this. I knew that I would be putting a further strain on this relationship. And I, um, I think that is something to really, I don't know that, that really keeps coming back to me. Um, I don't know if you guys find that interesting. Anyways, Heather's like, I signed up for this division and I respect that that's what it's going to be, you know? And I wonder at the end of the day, if Heather thinks it's worth it, if Heather thinks it's been worth it. I asked that in an interview the other day, I was like, has this journey been with, been worth it? But I would ask that of Heather as well. Has this all been worth it? Because you get this kind of fame, you get a lot of celebration. I mean, listen, if you type in realize was a Salt Lake city on Google in, in the Google search engine, it types up receipts, timeline. It actually has that at the very top. Google actually did that. Like that's got to fill this kind of, or you think it's going to fill this empty part of you. And it probably doesn't end up filling that. You know, don't we all have that too, where we think, oh, if I just get this, if this happens for me, I'm going to be on top of the world. It's going to fill that empty, deep hole inside of me. And then it never does. Right. And so I have this sneaking suspicion that I wonder what, if Heather thinks this has all been worth it or not. Anyways, uh, Andy goes, right. Um, Whitney, it was great seeing your mom at Bobby's birthday party. And we get a flashback to Lisa meeting Whitney's mom. And Andy's like, how long were you two estranged? And when did you start rebuilding? And she's like, this might make me cry. Um, it's been 16 years for us, you know, and, and there was a good decade where, and she's like, sorry, mom, we're in a better place now, but I have to speak the truth. 
Uh, and she's like, there's like birthdays where her mom didn't even text her or Christmases. And she's like, that was very hard. And then having a toxic father and then not a relationship with her mom for us to be able to work on it and build on it. And she texts me about the show like all the time, like how proud she is of me. So that's interesting. Well, I mean, the thing about it, 16 year division and then the show and actually kind of rebuilding that. And then Whitney being on a show right now, that's a lot to deal with mentally when he goes. And so for her to come to Bobby's party, it was huge. Well, I mean, I want to know what her mom thought about her giving her 13 year old daughter a fucking go golf cart that can go 30 miles an hour. And he's like, what was it that made her switch? And Whitney's like, we finally were able to have a very honest conversation about my childhood. I wish Whitney would have been like, well, it was me, me being on TV. <laughs> And a big factor was removing my father. And Andy goes, wow, side note, are you two back in touch? And when he's like, no, it's just not a relationship that is, I can't open that door. I can't. And he's like, okay. And he is um, avoiding it uh, as well. And I thought that was just really sad. I really, that really is sad. But I will tell you, Whitney seems to be one of the most self-actualized people on the cast. And even if you think Whitney gets it wrong, I do kind of respect her journey. Like it really does. You can tell like how much the Heather stuff has bothered her. You can tell she really works on this stuff. And that's why I think she is proud of like her relationship with Lisa Barlow because she's like, she took a lot of time. Like Whitney's one of the only people that tries to really understand people like and come and meet them kind of where they are instead of like, I just don't like this person. Whitney seems to try to understand that person. Now, like, yeah, I don't agree with what she said about the Bad Mormon book. I don't agree that she was like, oh, you exploited my sexuality. I don't agree with that. But I think that actually was in place of a lot of the shit that Heather has given to her over the seasons. Like, I always, I just, I say this, all, Heather looks down on Whitney. Even if Heather doesn't actually realize it, it comes off like that completely. And you do feel that after a while as a person that you are being looked down on by somebody who claims to be not only a friend, but family. So Andy goes, Monica, I think you and Angie K were tweeting back and forth at each other about the Greek Easter. Did someone get thrown down a staircase or something? And Lisa's like, no, Lisa, we didn't ask you. We're talking to Monica and Angie K right now. And now we see screenshots from Monica's Twitter. And we had heard about this, that remember Monica had to go to the hospital, but none of this was filmed. And this uh, Twitter from Monica says, say what you want about me, whore, rat, disrespectful, home, uh, uh, whore, spoiled, broke, an assistant, whatever you want to say, I let everybody run with it, but I made sure my girls were not there for that situation. That did not happen in front of my kids go through the stills. So they were saying like this whole blow up with falling down happened in front of her kids and it didn't. And then Angie K's Twitter, this is where all good fights happen, folks, not in a boxing ring on Twitter. Angie K says, production did you a favor. We don't need to see stills to know who, what you did, that you did this in front of your kids. Don't forget you almost hit my two-year-old niece in the head with your shoe when you throw it. And STFU, shut the fuck up, with your lies about Sean. Hashtag Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. You know it's good when Angie hashtags Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. And then another one from Monica, who is not hashtagging Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. She goes, Angie, dot, 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 you are a liar, all capitals. B, just like you lied about meeting me once. You and I both know all capitals. The kids were in your basement, you sick POS piece of shit. Go get your house up to code. I'm sending you my ER bill after falling down your basement stairs because you didn't have a railing. And Andy's like, what happened? And Monica's like, well, this was right after the conversation with my mom. I was going down in the basement to get my girls to leave and I started crying. So my eyes, I couldn't see. And I've never been to your house before. So I went to grab the railing. There was no railing. And we get to see, by the way, this is like my favorite foot. We see unseen footage. And I will say, at the, it's not Andy K's fault, but like, where the fuck really is the railing? Like, there you, like, isn't, is, you know, hey, uh, listen to my new listener in Salt Lake City. Isn't it code to have a railing downstairs? Like, don't you have to have that in a build? Um, it did seem wild that the railing wasn't there, but we see Monica walking away from her mom and walking to the basement staircase and she turns the corner. We hear a loud thud. That's where the camera stops. And, um, and we hear a thud and we, we hear the sound because the mic's on, but we don't see it. We just hear like, uh, ah, ooh, ooh, fuck shit, ooh, ah, ooh, oh, ooh, ah, oops, ah, ooh. And then we see a camera, like, like a man and woman run up to help um, Monica and ask if she's okay. And Monica's like, it's fine, I'm okay. And the man's like, it's those damn heels. And the woman's like, do you want to take your shoes off? Get your heels off. And the man's like, that's scary. Are you hurt? And Monica's like, I want to go home now. And we see her take off one and we see her kind of toss one, but she didn't throw it at the knees. She kind of just tossed it. So, Angie K, like uh, Angie K has a lot of points. This isn't one of them. She did not throw it at a two year old niece. She tossed it. Angie K in the reunion says, but then you threatened to sue me online, which I think we should discuss that. And Monica's like, okay, Angie. And Angie K is like, yeah, 
I'm listening. And Monica's like, is there anything you don't have a problem with me? And uh, with, with me? And Angie's like, this coming from you, Monica? And Monica's like, did I sue you? And Andy's like, well, you threatened to sue her. And Monica's like, I said, should I? And Angie K's like, no, you didn't. You said, I should sue you, you fuck. And then we get a screenshot of Monica's tweet and go, almost hit your nie niece. You are the biggest freaking asshole. You know damn well what happened. I left your house with bumps, bloody, and bruise. I should sue your ass for not having your home to code, you fuck. And we see actually pictures of the, the bruises did look really fucking intense. And Monica's like, oh. And Angie Kay's like, and you said you piece of shit. And Monica's like, well, yeah, I did say all of that. And you were a piece of shit. And Angie Kay's like, yeah, classy Monica. And Monica's like, I was responding to what you tweeted first, Angie. And Angie's like, yeah, you threw a shoe and almost hit a toddler. And Monica's like, I would have never said, I did not throw a shoe. My shoes went flying. And Angie Kay's like, okay, you tell your side and I'll tell my side because I will listen and you won't. And Angie Kay goes, so I'll let you get it out and I'll follow with the response. And that's how it should go. That's how grown up talks, but I'm good with children, so I can handle Monica. And Angie, I'm like, Angie, you're doing good. Just take the foot out the gas. Just a hair, man. It's that Greek mafia shit. And um, Monica goes, Okay, one shoe went flying off. My other shoe was hanging off. I undid it. I threw it down. I said, I want to go home. And Angie's like, Okay, and what else happened? And Monica's like, And then I was blooded and breeding and blooding. Bloody, bloody, bloody. I was bloodied and bleeding and bruised and went upstairs and filmed a scene with my mom. We see another shot. Oh, this is the shot of the bruised legs. And it says, after falling down Angie's stairs at Greek Easter. I love when anybody talks about Easter. They always, they need to say Greek Easter. I love that it's almost like a trail. Like, it's not just Easter, it's Greek Easter. Like, normally, if you're, like, in a rage, you would just be, like, at Easter. But I love that everybody's giving the respect of Greek Easter to put the Greek word in there. And she's like, you had no railing. Everyone's saying I left my mom. Yes, yes, I did. And I went straight to the hospital, and she knew I fell down the stairs. My combo with her on the couch was after the fall. And Monica's like, and I told my mom, find your old ride home. Dead ass. And she got an Uber. And I guess production called her an Uber. And then she said, I'm not getting in that shit box because it was a Subaru. Oh my God, you guys, Subaru's taking hits now. By the way, Monica, listen, you will lose me forever if you start bagging on Corollas. Just do not do it. This is another example of when I think production should come on and let us know if this is true or not. And Andy's like, oh my God, she did that. And Whitney's like, Linda. And Monica's like, I just went to urgent care. That's where I just went. And, uh, and then Angie's like, okay, can I speak now? And Monica's like, well, you might have a better memory since you didn't hit your head, so go ahead. And Angie Kay's like, okay, Monica, I do have a really good memory of the day because I had a family that left because they felt it wasn't a safe environment. It's my turn. You go online, you threaten to sue me and then say, I should send you the bill for my head scan, which you did not pay for. Production paid that bill. So now you're telling the entire internet. <laughs> the entire. Well, to be fair, Angie Kay, there's only a certain slice of the internet that actually even gives a shit about any of this. Monica is like, you started at first with your nasty ass tweet and I responded nasty back. And Angie's like, what was nasty about my tweet? And Lisa's like, what was nasty about the tweet? I want to know. Shut the fuck up about Sean. That was the tweet, basically. And Monica's like, no. And Angie's like, I just want to be clear. And Monica goes, and to be fair, I had a conversation with Meredith and I told her the situation and she said, do you want her house? You could take her house. Boom, this was great information. And Meredith all of a sudden comes alive and she kind of has a smile. She's like, I did not say you could take anyone's house ever. <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, let's be clear, I did not say that. And then Monica goes, Yes, you did. And Heather goes, Meredith, did you say that? And Monica's like, Oh, let's get you the house. Yes, she did. And Meredith goes, Okay, well, I said it could be a potential liability. Absolutely. This is classic Meredith Marks right here. Meredith Marks will never admit defeat. Like we saw that last week in the first part of the reunion with Andy talking about the, you know, the, the stuff about the husband. Like, I did not say anything about the relationship. I threatened to say something about the husband. And Andy's like, it's the same thing. No, Andy, it is not. Let me read you exactly what I said about this. So here we said, like, I didn't, I didn't say anything like that. And then she goes, okay, but what I did say is a potential liability. Absolutely. I would be ignorant if I didn't say that, Andrew. And Angie Kay goes, well, you know what? And Monica goes, she said, well, let's get you that house. And Angie Kay's like, wow. <laughs> I love Mer Meredith. That is so amazing of let's get you that house. I mean, truly, that is credible. If I want to go for the jugular and talk about the the rumors and yeah. nastiness about yeah. her, well, we can do that. Mm -hmm. You know what? You want me to go there with her husband? I can go there. Yo with me okay tell her that you can leave 
let's get that house. Let's do it now. I didn't say that. Um, so we come back from commercial and Angie K goes, it's apparent that you make a living off of suing people. And Monica's like, bitch, I have never sued one person in my life. This is what Monica needs to scrub from her. Like it's, it's the fucking, like it, it, it's, it, she's like too, she's like her DNA is mixed with Twitter talk. It's like where that's where people talk like, listen, you fuck nut. Like Monica, just say, I have never sued one person in my life. Do you need to throw in the bitch? I know it's, it's just take the bitch out. Your, your message is going to get there clear. You know, the onus is on you. You are, have to be on the defensive right now and be doing the bitch shit is not serving your purpose. Like it's fun vernacular and it's great to like say out loud. It's, a, you know, trippingly on the tongue, but th- just say, I've never sued one person in my life. The bitch, we just then focus on the bitch instead of what you're saying. And Angie K goes, there are multiple lawsuits under several of your names. And Monica goes, oh my God, who have I sued? And Angie K goes, there are, it's all over the internet. And Monica's like, who the fuck have I sued? And Angie K goes, you threatened to sue me. You're suing her. And Heather goes, you are suing me. And Monica's like, who have I sued? And Andy goes, are you suing Heather? Andy, you know damn well right she is. And Monica's like, no, I responded to her suing me. And Heather goes, it's a countersuit. Meredith goes, it's a countersuit. Meredith goes, it's a countersuit. And Andy goes, that's a countersuit. And Monica's like, yeah, yeah. And Heather goes, you're suing me right now. And Monica's like, well, I would have never sued you, though I responded to you suing me, which any person would do in the system. Now, this is another thing. This is why I really do think Heather is like truly done with Monica and out to get her because they're suing over $2,100. Now, if you even take the money that Monica put on her like chive card, chime card in Bermuda, $700, that she only owes her $1,400 more. Like, listen, I understand it's the point of the matter, but I have a feeling Beauty Lab and Laser is not taking all of these clients that haven't paid to court. I think it, you found out it was Monica. You really wanted to turn the screw. So of course you're going to be countersued. Like if it's a publicity game at this point, Monica is definitely in the wrong, but I feel like you could have worked this out behind the scenes and you know, you can, you wanted to embarrass her. You're mad. You're angry. I get that. Um, I do want to know what Angie K is saying about the other lawsuits, though. I want that information. This is the kind of stuff that I wish Andy wouldn't let go. Like, let's get into this. Let's have an addendum to this, please. Um, Heather goes, but that's a collection, suing you for collections. And Angie K goes, like, Angie K goes, why sue back? Pay your fucking bill. And Monica's like, God damn, no. And Angie K goes, pay your bill. You've got lawsuits, Monica. And Angie's like, okay, okay, moving on. <laughs> Darcy from Philadelphia said, Lisa, you told Monica no one wants to be your mom. Do you regret saying that? And Lisa goes, um, the conversation got misconveyed. I think she meant to say misconstrued, but I love Lisa. Like, misconveyed. And she said, you're not my mom. And Monica goes, misconveyed? And Lisa's like, listen, I rebuttaled as sophomoric as you dished it. I rebuttaled. Uh, Lisa goes, you were the nasty one all season, not me, Monica. And Monica's like, I was not the nasty one all season. Yes, you were. And Monica's like, I was responding to your energy I was given. Fix your face. You're fucking ugly. Look at your fucking ugly face. Doing Monica's line. And Monica's like, she calls Meredith the trampoline with eyes. Are you joking? And Angie K goes, um, that means her skin's nice and smooth and tight. <laughs> I love that Angie K is trying to be a mini Meredith Marks, like where she won't admit defeat of like trampling with eyes. You're never going to be able to convince me that's a compliment. But Angie K is like, that means her skin's nice and tight. It's like a baby's bottom. It's just that's a, one of the highest compliments ever you can get is a trampling with eyes. It's just it is. And Monica's like, that's not what it meant. And Lisa's like, Monica, Monica, don't bring anybody else into this. Just me. And Monica's like, you're insulting Meredith and you know it. Stop. I want to be a trampoline with eyes. She's like crazy. And Heather goes, honestly, what I want to be too. Now they're all going like, oh, yay, trampoline with eyes. Okay, everybody be trampoline with eyes. And Lisa's like, Monica, you were nasty to me all season. You can poke, 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 poke if you get it. And Monica goes, too shit, bitch. Too shit. Meaning touche. And like, can somebody tell me, is this a callback? Did like Lisa Barlow say touche earlier this season? Because I know Monica knows that's not how to say touche. But I do think like at this point, is Monica trying to speak in T-shirt slogans? And also, why wasn't there a fucking touche shirt made like ASAP? Monica, you need to be more on this shit. Like touche, bitch, touche. That should be a T-shirt. And Lisa's like, no, it's not. No, it's not. And Heather goes, touche. What does touche mean? You came up to me. You came up to me for losing my ring. You called me a piece of shit. You called me ugly. You're not. By the way, now I'm starting to make Lisa Barlow Mr. Movie Phone. You've called Movie Phone. If you'd like to see Napoleon, press one. If you'd like to see Hunger Games, The Ballad of Snakes and Roses, press two. If you'd like to see Oppenheimer. You're nasty to women. You are. And Monica's like, no, you are. 
And then he's like, well, okay, well, and Monica's like, so are you Lisa? And Lisa's like, I am not. I made one comment. And Monica's like, you are, you're not nasty to people. And Lisa goes, you can cling to that one comment all you want. And Monica's like, you're not nasty to people. No, I am not. And Monica's like, were you nasty to Meredith? It's none of your business what I was nasty with. We fixed our stuff. And Monica's like, you don't get to throw shit in my face and not catch it back. Oh no, you started it with piece of shit. There is so much of you started it. There's so much of still, we never escape preschool childhood bullshit. The you started it stuff. Like all of the, the Twitter fight, you started it on Twitter, you started it here. And it's just ridiculous. Monica's like, don't dish it if you can't take it. And Lisa goes, and 1% of everything. Because last episode, Monica was like, oh, I realize now you're not the 1%. Which by the way, Lisa Barlow now in the second part seems to almost be offended of like, I do, like I am the 1%. And even on Twitter last night, Lisa was like, I am the 1%. <laughs> I'm like, girl, pick a lane, man. Monica goes, don't dish it if you can't take it. No, you can dish and can't take. You just, and Monica's like, no, you're right. I was wrong about that. You're not the 1%. And Lisa goes, you can get anywhere with you. You can't get anywhere. Listen, this is why your mom talks to a tree because you can't, you don't listen. You just want to dish and dish and dish. And Monica's like, okay, throw my mom in my face. You're manipulative. And Angie K goes, she is. And Lisa's like, you're so fucking manipulative. And Monica's like, I'm manipulative. You just said it. I'm not manipulative. And Lisa's like, listen, here, I'm going to be very direct with you. I feel like Lisa had been like, do you hear this? Let me turn it up. With like, you know, my dad used to do that middle finger. It'd be like, he put the middle finger down. He'd like, you know, can you hear this? You want me to turn it up and then turn up the middle finger? I feel like that's where Lisa Barlow, like, do you hear this? My middle finger. How about if I turn it up? And Monica goes, that's stating the fact. You threw my mother in my fucking face. I'm going to get very clear with you. And Monica's like, which, by the way, is disgusting what you said. You can't get anywhere with it. They're just saying the same shit over and over again. They're just back and forth, back and forth. And Lisa's like, I said no one wants to be your mom, clearly, because you said I'm not your mom. And Monica's like, exactly, which is disgusting. When your husband was adopted. And Lisa's like, no, it's not. It's not disgusting. You're such a bitch, Lisa. And Whitney's like, my ears are like literally hurting. B like poor Whitney blood is pouring out of her ears. And Lisa's like, John was not even offended by that comment. And Heather's like, the things you said about us is nothing. And then Monica's like, Heather, I don't even know what your problem is with me. And Lisa's like, listen, John's not interested in you. So don't even worry about it. And Monica's like, dead ass. I don't know what the fuck your problem is, is with me. And Heather's like, well, give it a minute. I'll let you know. And Andy's like, all right, she's going to tell you in a little bit. And Monica's like, okay, great. And Andy's like, at nasty speaker said, Lisa, what did you mean when you said during the sound bath, we were dealt the same deck of cards and reference to Monica. And Lisa's like, I look at things like the most positive way. It's like, Hey, listen. And Monica laughs. She's like, I do. I do. And from what I'm seeing, I don't know anything about your relationship with your mom. I asked you at the sound bath. Just think how ridiculous that is to, to actually put in a sentence of like, just think about that of like talking like it was at the sound bath. Just the fact that the sound bath is a location. Do you fucking hate your mother? And why do you want us to fucking hate your mother? I asked you like four times. You didn't have an answer. You'll see. You'll see is what you said. And Monica's like, yeah, because you didn't know. It's not important. And Andy goes, well, so now you've seen. It's not important. And Monica's like, now you've seen. And Lisa goes, listen, the bottom line is you would not stop. You said I'm med mediocre. You went after my family. You said nasty things about my husband who you don't even know. You and Angie K's like, yeah, you called him a penis head. Are you a fucking penis head? I didn't realize we were calling people penis heads. And Monica's like, oh, and Lisa's like, yeah, you were being so rude about him. And Monica's like, I did, I did call him a penis head. And Lisa's like, you're being so rude about him. And others like, why did you call John a penis head? And Lisa's like, she's sitting there screaming at me. You're mediocre. Your business is mediocre. And Angie K was like, and then five minutes later, she said she wanted to fuck him. And then we had a flashback to Bermuda where Monica was saying she would fuck John and Seth in the game of Mary Fuck Kill. Which, by the way, this would be a perfect time. Like, all right, it's me, Seth. I'm glad I finally got a fucking mention in this in part two of the reunion. And it's a mention in the right way because uh, I love it. All the ladies of Salt Lake want to bone me, Seth. I'm in Canton, Ohio in a business. Lisa. <laughs> Sorry. Andy goes, um, at Lou in reality tweeted, why does Monica have so many identities found on Google? And then Andy's like, so your maiden name was Fowler. And she's like, no, my maiden name is Darnell. Fowler is my middle name. And Andy goes, what's Delgado? And Monica's like, that's my dad's side. And Andy goes, that's your dad's side. What's Garcia? Garcia is my mother's side. My mother was born Linda Darnell, Susan Maria Garcia. <gasps> Whew. 
And Andy's like, okay. And Monica's like, okay. When she was growing up, she was teased for being a Portuguese in Boston, and she was called a spick all the time, and it stuck with her. I don't know. So when she became of legal age, she chopped her entire name off because she was ashamed of it. And she just kept Linda Darnell. So when I was born, I was Linda Darnell. And Andy goes, you were Monica Darnell. And Monica goes, well, Monica, Linda Darnell. And I was like, this is like, who's on first? Like, this is like, uh, how many names are we throwing out here? Heather goes, they have the same name. And Andy's like, oh, okay. And Monica's like, yeah, but that name means nothing to me. So when I was getting a divorce, I wanted a family name. And Andy's like, got it. So you, you've used four names. And Monica's like, I legally have only ever used three which is the one I was born with when I got married and when I got divorced. And Andy goes, your mom was confused that you changed your name so many times. And we get a flashback to Linda and Monica and Linda going, Monica Darnell. And Monica's like, that's not, why are you calling me that? And Linda goes, I'm sorry. I don't know what the fuck your name is. You change every fucking week. This is what I'm saying. The mom with the potty mouth. And Andy goes, why would she be confused? And Monica's like, so she definitely brought that up as a dig because I had confided in her that certain people here were making fun of the fact that I was using Delgado Doriano, Garcia, whatever I was going to use, because they were saying I was trying to make myself look more Latina to get on the show. And Elisa's like, who said that? And Monica's like, you did. And Lisa's like, I did not say it. Don't look at me. And I say, I said that. You said it. I did not say that. No, I did not. You know who said that. And Monica's like, you said that I opened a book and found my name. And Lisa's like, Jen said that. And Monica's like, no, she didn't. And Angie King goes, yeah, she did. And Monica's like, Jen's not even around. And Lisa goes, Jen saw, Jen Shaw said you went by. And Monica's like, okay, so you were repeating what Jen said. And Lisa goes, you fake fucking bitch. And Monica's like, ah. And then we go to a commercial. We come back. Welcome back to the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City reunion. Lisa, I love that we just drop in and we're like on to a different topic. Like, I want to know more about the names. Like, what are we, are we you know, because the names also is why she's probably in Beauty Lab and Laser. Like, how many names is she in that computer system under? Anyways, Lisa, Jack Barlow was recently seen in California in his mission garb. So what's going on? Did he not go to Columbia? And Lisa's like, he bounced on his mission. He's not going. He's just hanging out with friends, surfing, doing all the good stuff. And and he's like, no, really, what's happening? And Lisa's like, um, the way they put in the paperwork and the way they apply for visas, sometimes visas take a little longer. And Heather goes, but it's a very common practice. The king of Mormon has spoken. Heather, thank you. Heather's like, you get your mission call to a foreign country and the paperwork comes in later, but they don't want you to wait. And he's like, so they send you out in the field stateside. I get it. And Lisa's like, they send him to California to temporarily speaking Spanish. Jack's the reason his visa took longer because he had a great six pack and took a picture on the boat and sent it to the government as his visa picture, like as his visa picture, thinking it's funny. And they they denied it, so we had to. Re- we had to reapply. <laughs> it's why I feel like the government should take. Like the government should be like, "Oh, this is funny." I appreciate the six pack, but also, I also would figure like Jack's like really truly doing this by himself. Like Lisa or the dad didn't check this information of like, "Hey, bud, why are you sending this uh, half nude photo? What is, is this OnlyFans? What's going on, bud?" It it seems like. And also these pictures for the thing, isn't it just like a picture of your face? It's like, got to get the butt in there. Got to see the, look how ripped I am. <laughs> and Andy goes, hold on, hold on. Uh, can I see the pic? No, he goes, his uh, his picture that he submitted for his visa. And Lisa goes, was on a boat in Lake Powell. And Andy's like, that's not the important part. I like Lisa was like, oh, you want to know where? And Lisa goes, yeah, shirtless. Yes. This has, and Andy goes, this has to be the first Mormon missionary whose visa was re- rejected due to like, and Lisa's like, yes, I love that, that. It's like being hot and Heather's like shirtless. And Lisa's like, in his defense, he's been working out really hard. What a mom. Like, it's obviously a fuck up. And he's like, but for real though, a lot of hard work went into that ripped body. And Heather goes, this is why I needed to be involved. Oh, Heather. And Lisa's like, his visa's here. He's on his way to Columbia and he's so happy. And Andy's like, oh, so his visa's here. And when is he, when is he going to Columbia? And Lisa's like, his, uh, he leaves next week. And Andy's like, oh, wow. And Lisa's like, yeah, the week after Thanksgiving. And Andy's like, wow. So did you get to spend Thanksgiving with him or no? He's on a mission. And Lisa's like, no, we don't get to see him. We talk to him once a week. Actually, today's the day he can call and I'm here. And Andy's like, right. Uh, and he's like, so he sent me the cutest video message last night and was like, good luck, mom. I'm totally ripped. I miss Lake Powell. No, he goes, and just like love talking to him so much now. I feel like it's changed our relationship so much because he's a maturing a lot. And I think there's a lot of gratitude that's happening. And she's smiling the whole time she's saying this. You can tell she's really very proud 
Um, Lisa Barlow just is just a force upon herself. What a, a unique person that I really truly can't figure out. But I love how she, I love how she loves. I love how she loves her family. And I will tell you, I told you this when I talked with John Barlow at BravoCon. Everybody was trying to say like, oh, he's not going on his mission. But John told me that Mr. Barlow told me that day, like, yeah, he got paperwork things. He wants to go. Like, and this is one of those things that I think the Bravo audience were so scandaled out that we make everything this fucking meal when sometimes it's just people doing normal fucking stupid things. It's kids doing stupid stupid things like we did stupid things i'm still doing stupid things you're still doing like accidents happen mistakes happen the human experience is completely wild and bizarre not everything some like mystery to be uncovered um andy goes okay at echo does radio tweeted i'm still wondering why friends and family aren't allowed to visit for the two years that they're on the mission that's a red flag to me why aren't families visits allowed and lisa's like mind your fucking business at echo does radio no she goes you know he is focused on doing his service work and i think it would be distracting if we called into his mission president and say we're coming to columbia we would absolutely be able to see him we would but we're respecting jack's decision and that he's like happy doing this like he's thriving and that's the other thing too um and john mr sorry mr barlow said this when he was like oh my god i'm trying to stop lisa from buying up half of columbia just to live there and i was like yeah i bet uh that sounds like lisa but you know obviously i don't necessarily agree with aspects of the mormon religion and certain tenets in the faith but you know yeah they, i mean that's part of it is you are being trained to be a servant of god it is it is kind of like this not military service, but it is this commitment to something greater that these people believe in. And you are learning to sacrifice. You are learning to sacrifice like the teachings of the Lord, like the Lord did. And I can see why, but it is really painful. Um, Andy says, Derwin from Los Angeles said, Lisa, you say you support the LGBTQ community, yet you continue to show, show your support for the Mormon church who continue to actively fight the community's rights and livelihood. How do you support both without being a hypocrite? Um, I'm not a hypocrite and I do support both, but the thing is it's wrong for any Mormon or anyone nowhere in the teachings of Christ. Did it say gays aren't allowed? God was a huge fan of Gaga. He's a little monster. No. And he's like, mm -hmm. and Lisa's like, I don't live that way. I don't practice that way. I also work on building bridges with the Mormon church and the LGBTQIA community because I think it's important. Like, I think it's antiquated way of thinking. And I think all religions were not nice to the LGBTQIA community, not just the LDS religion. And Heather's like, it's true. Thank you, Heather. Um, it's hard though, right? That's a, that's a weird thing right there because this Mormon, this church and a lot of churches, a lot of religions, not just the Mormon religion have, uh, you know, spoken out against the LGBTQIA communities and that's really dangerous. So it is hard to kind of just be that middle of the road thing. I understand what she's doing and what she's saying, but there are horrors and atrocities committed into that where it does damage. I mean, it also damages families within these, you know, I, I grew up once I moved to Arizona from Kansas. That was my first time being around Mormons. And I, uh, a lot of my best friends were Mormon. And I, 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 you know, learned a lot about the Mormon churches and, and uh, had so much fun and, you know, so many laughs and there was always uh, so, such good natured. And, you know, it was just so interesting to be being around people that couldn't, you know, drink caffeine and everything was family oriented, like family, uh, family home evening where they would just sit around and play games. And it really, you know, I thought that was such an amazing aspect of that religion. But then I got to see and be uh, aware of darker sides of that, you know, and had friends that were uh, gay and that had to deal with that in the Mormon religion and, and seeing how that worked and it, it wasn't pretty. And this is, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and maybe things have changed, but it, it was very painful to watch firsthand. And that's hard because you're thinking like, okay, if God created me, and I actually do have feelings for a same sex. Why? I mean, how is that? How can that be wrong? Why would God create something that, I mean, it can really confuse somebody. And especially at an age of growing up where you are, your brain is being formed and you're trying to figure out what life is. And, it, you know, it's just, it's really, really tough stuff. And he goes, here's a really interesting question. Tiffany from Portland said, Lisa, are you worried at all that when Jack comes on, he's going to be more orthodox and begin to question your Mormon 2.0 assertion? And Lisa's like, not even a little bit. I'm not even a little bit because I consider myself non-orthodox. Orthodox. Jack, when we do talk, he's like excited. He's like, mom, imagine when I get home, I can help you and dad with the business in Mexico. And like, I just think it's going to be him. He's going to be him. He's going to be the exact same kid. And when he gets back, I love it. I also 
I like to think of Lisa's business is just like, like it's like Greek mafia related. He's like, I'm going to be a part of the family business, mom. And he goes, but he's not going to be the exact same kid. And Lisa's like, I know, but I think he'll be a better version of himself. I think that he's learning so many hard life skills like that. And if he's more orthodox because he is teaching the teachings of Christ, I'm fine with that. And he's not going to judge his parents. We didn't raise him to be judgmental of people. I like basically it's like, and we've paid for him all along. So we can't do that. Also, just imagine how different Jack's diet is now. Like he was pumped. She pumps those kids full of Diet Coke and Taco, Taco Bell. Like this kid's probably having vegetables for the first time. I mean, it's just like, he's probably detox like heavily right now and he goes what's your reaction to that question and heather goes i mean it's complicated everything she's saying is absolutely true he's going to learn independence he's going to learn frugality he's going to lose those abs he's going to learn that he has to wake up and work no matter what he's going to learn to work in the rain and the snow he's going to come home fluent in spanish he's going to come home a man okay heather and when he's like and i want to warn you lisa i had two brothers go i've had cousins go i've had stepsons come i've had stepsons go they come home weird for a minute. And Heather's like, they come home weird. And Lisa's like, you know, Whitney. And Heather's like, they come home judgy. And Whitney's like, because they're not used to being like back in the normal life. And Lisa's like, but I also think John and I raised him so differently. And I know it's hard to understand because you're not in our home. And when he's like, it's not weird in a bad way. And Lisa's like, yeah, we raised him so differently. Like John served a mission. My sister served a mission. My brother served in Bilbao, Spain. And I think it's like we had a different perspective. And when my brother came home, I didn't think he was weird. He just like he got right back into life and he had a different set of he had a different skill set and he spoke Spanish. And he wrote with a different hand and his acne had cleared up and the color of his eyes changed and he was able to shoot lightning bolts out of his hand, but not anything different than that. And then he's like, so Heather, <laughs> Sorry. and he goes, so Heather, why was Jack's mission triggering to you? And when he's like, I want to know this. And Heather goes, oh, in a million ways. Um, one of them being, I needed a storyline. And Andy's like, right. And Heather goes, even just watching him read his letter. And we get a flashback to Jack Barlow, letting us know that he got called to Columbia on the mission. And Heather's like, it just reminds me of when I grew up and what I no longer have. Like seeing all of those celebrations and knowing that I wasn't there and not welcome for obvious reasons. Like I knew why, but it still didn't help me to not feel hurt and sad, you know? And Lisa's like, well, she thinks the reasons are different than the intention. To me, I thought it was mean to like rub it in her face. And then I also wasn't in like the best place with Heather where I wanted to be like, come share in this. I mean, Whitney left the church and she was there. And Andy's like, but well, I mean, she's kind of at this moment, kind of a hater towards the church. And Heather's like, absolutely. Yeah. And Lisa's like, yeah, yeah, it wouldn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. I didn't question it at all. Heather like totally and admits to realizing and he goes, why would she include you? And Heather's like, well, it was mostly because Whitney got included and she's anti. And, and he's like, right. And Heather goes, she's, you know, way more advanced than me. And Whitney's like, well, actually, now that you two are good, you relentlessly came after me, Heather, for supporting Jack in the mission. And you called me a hypocrite over it. And now we get some unseen footage. This is great unseen footage, by the way. I wish this was in the actual show. Heather's like, in this unseen footage, the, fit the unseen footage, Heather's like, Lisa says she's a Mormon and she's not, and no one calls her out on it. I feel like you of all people would know that. And it's frustrating to me that you're so scared to upset Lisa that you would never say to what you would say openly and a thousand times to me or to anyone. And when he's like, I'm not scared, Heather. And Heather's like, when it comes to Lisa. And when he's like, what do you think I'm scared of saying? And Heather's like, that's like, there's no way that she's going to be going to the temple if she's not wearing her garments and drinking alcohol. That's just a basic fact. And uh, this is like a perfect example of this relationship of like Heather going, you don't deserve to go to Lisa's and like, you should be calling around on this, this, this. And it's like, dude, just because Lisa is not amazing with you, Heather, doesn't mean you have to put, you know, Whitney into the same spot you're in. Like, how is that Whitney's responsibility? What I said is Whitney tries to meet people where they're at, you know, period. And Heather goes, or sorry, Whitney goes, do you understand why I had a certain level of respect of not wanting to talk about it now? And I was like, but we did talk about it. It was just, it was just me saying, how do you address this? How do you show up and say congratulations when there's conflicts within? And when he's like, yeah, but I feel like when I saw you call me a hypocrite, I was like, wow, Heather. No, I was trying my best to support my friend who has a completely different belief system than I do. And he's like, mm-hmm. And when he's like, and I was there. And Lisa's like, and you separated it. Yeah, I separated it. 
Um, and Heather's like, if I use the word hypocrite, and when he's like, you called me a hypocrite. And Heather's like, I just wanted to talk through it because it felt challenging to me for us to say, congratulations, go get it, go get them. Meanwhile, we're saying this can be destructive. This can be dangerous. And I have deep regrets about my mission. I mean, all of the intentions are wonderful, but how do I extrapolate those intentions from what the ultimate goal of a Mormon missionary is? But Heather, that's the deal. It's not your job. You don't have to worry about it. You weren't invited. It's not your deal. It's not, period. Um, Lisa's like, and I tried to make that easy for Heather by not pushing it in your face. And Heather goes, yeah. And I didn't understand. I thought she was just excluding me. And Annie's like, okay, so let Whitney ask her question. And Whitney's like, yeah. So my question though is like, looking back at it now, do you feel bad for calling me a hypocrite? Because now you get it. You have to compartmentalize it. And I was like, yeah, I mean, completely. Sure. You, you, you know, you have to put it aside. And when he's like, I just need to hear from you that you feel bad. And Heather's like, yes. And when he's like, because I was in the middle of it. And Heather's like, you have to put aside your political and emotional views and say, I'm a mom supporting a friend and I will be here for her if he comes home militantly orthodox. And she's like, what do I do with this? I'll be like, I'll talk you through it. Heather's like, I wrote a book. You can read it. And Whitney's like, this is a new thing for me. The agreements on the mission. And I love it. So Whitney is really taking this moment seriously when I think Heather is just trying to get Whitney off her back. And Lisa's like, yeah, it's good. And Annie's like, all right, let's hold there. So we're going to take a break. Mary M. Cosby is coming out. And Lisa's like, there's like SWAT people all around. There's like snipers on the roof. Like, bring out Mary Cosby. And Whitney's like, I'll be at lunch. I'll see you all later. She's like joking. Meredith laughs. Like, <laughs> no reaction from Monica. Meredith, except for a couple of moments, has said very little up to this point. And Annie's like, oh, I got to run to the restroom. All the ladies head back to their dress rooms to take a break. Mary comes into Monica's room. Mary's wearing this like blue gown. And, you know, Monica's like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And Mary looks at Monica. And Mary's like, you look gorgeous. Thank you. And Mary's like, look at this emerald green. And Monica's like, you look stunning. Kind of like, oh my God, you're the only person that will talk to me. I'm going to throw every compliment your way. You look stunning. And Mary's like, how are you? And Monica's like, come in, come in, sit down. Have you been watching it all? No. And Mary's like, is this a TV show? No. And Monica's like, oh man, it's in a bloodbath. Heather and Lisa and Angie are relentless with me. And Mary's like, and they feel like you did them wrong? And Monica's like, yes. And Mary's like, so they're like done with you? And Monica's like, correct. And Mary's like, without you saying why or explaining anything? And Monica's like, I am not explaining my situation, no. And then Mary goes, okay, so that's unacceptable. And Monica's like, yeah. And Mary's like, yeah, you have a side, you have a voice, and we're going to hear it. And Monica's like, thank you. And Mary's like, and yeah, I got your back. So I'm like, oh shit, we got some reinforcements. Da -da -da, da -da -da. The ladies head back to the stage and Mary walks out with them. Now, of course, the obvious thought here is, do you want Mary Cosby on your side? Is that potentially another shot against you? If you're like, Mary agrees with me. <laughs> I love all the ladies for the most part. Also, just still... It's like that thing where I'm like, I don't understand the Jen Shaw of it all with all the ladies, how they still kind of like are scared of Jen Shaw. I also don't understand why they all kind of seemingly kiss Mary Cosby's ass. I feel like there was some pact with producers that said, you got to, you just got to be nice. There's like, you're going to get fined. We're going to charge you a hundred thousand dollars every time you make fun of Mary Cosby. Cause Heather's like, look who's here. And Mary on the way in trips in the, like the fake snow on the set and like a producer grabs her and I just wanted Meredith to be like, you know, you can shoe, you can shoe this place or that. You know that, right? Anyway, Mary's like, I'm okay. <laughs> and Lisa's like, Mary down, Mary down. And Andy's like, Mary M, hi. Hi, Andy, how are you? Hi. And Monica's like, Mary, you look beautiful. All right, everybody, we're back in five, four, three. And Lisa's like, do I have to suck in her stomach? And Heather's like, yes. Welcome back and pop the 2003 Dom Perignon because we're joined by our old friend, Mary M. Cosby. Hey, Mary. Hi, Andy. Great to see you at the reunion. We missed you at, uh, you know, and uh, Andy, I don't know. Mary's like, Andy, are you going to make me pay for that? And Andy's like, okay. And Mary's like, thank you. And Andy's like, okay, we missed you at our last reunion. Flashback to season two in 2021 when Mary chose not to join the cast at the reunion. And Andy's like, well, why did you not want to be a part of that? And Mary's like, well, first of all, how I was treated the entire season and then how things were allegedly said that was completely not true. I didn't feel comfortable. And so I didn't come. And Andy's like, when you were on Watch What Happens Live, I asked you why you came back to the show and you said, to help you guys out. Um, I'm wondering if the other women, did you feel you needed Mary back this season to help out? And Heather's like, yeah, I did. I mean, yeah. And Angie Kay's like, there was some comedic relief. That was good. You're hilarious. And Mary's like, Angie, this is your first year. Kind of like, why the fuck are you talking? And Angie Kay goes, I know. And Mary's like, why are you even answering? Oh my gosh. I love that. I love Angie K. Finally, like Angie K. was like, I did good for like half of a reunion. I can speak up more. And then Mary completely like, shut up. 
shut up, little girl. Andy K. Andy's like, well, she was answering nicely about you, Mary. And Mary's like, oh, she was? And I was like, yeah. And Andy goes, <laughs> love Mary's like, oh, okay. And Andy's like, yeah, okay. So she said we need the comedic relief. Heather, you were saying, Heather's like, well, I was just saying, you never know what you're going to get with Mary Cosby. And that's kind of fun and makes filming with her exciting. And so it felt right that she's back. And while Heather is talking, Angie K leans over and tells Mary she has lipstick on her teeth. Mary goes, thank you. So like Angie K is really trying to help Mary. And he goes, okay, Mary, you were open to Monica right away, but you seem dismissive of Angie from the jump. What was it about her that set you off? And Mary's like, well, when I see Angie, it just makes me think of Jen. And Andy's like, uh-huh. We get a flashback to earlier in the season when Angie K walks into an event and Mary whispers, oh my God, I thought that was Jen. And Mary's like, I mean, she looks like Jen. You know, Jen kind of dressed alike and they're all like the same height and she just scared me. And I was like, not Jen again. And then she kept touching my clothes with her cake. Do you remember that? You had cake and, you know, she had cake and she was like, Mary, and she was touching me. And I was like, stop touching me. And Heather goes, oh, with the banana bread. And Mary's like, yeah, it was bread. And Heather goes, at the fresh powder, the the, the first episode. And Angie Kay's like, well, I am definitely really touchy. Not with Sean. He won't touch me. Flashback to the same event where Angie Kay's eating that piece of banana bread, sits next to Mary, and Angie Kay's like grabbing Mary's knee and rubbing it. And you just, Mary looks annoyed. And Angie Kay goes, I didn't realize. And Mary's like, she is. She's a toucher. And Heather's like, you spilled banana bread on her. And Angie Kay goes, did I really? And Mary's like, yeah. And Angie Kay's like, oh, okay, I'm so sorry. And Mary's like, it's okay. And then Kay goes, well, send me the dry cleaning bill. I am touchy. I'll make sure to rein it in. And Heather's like, rein it in. And then Kay's like, yeah, I reined it in. And then he's like, who in the group do you like? And Mary's like, um, and then pauses like, um, okay. So, uh, I do like Angie. Like she just decided she liked Angie in that little pause. Like she just decided. And then he's like, oh, okay. You like Angie. I do. I do. And it's like, oh, okay. I do. Cause Angie, uh, she can take my toughness. And Andy's like, okay, she can handle me. Okay. And then Mary goes, I like Monica. She's pretty. I think she's a good addition. And uh, I love Meredith. And Meredith goes, I love you. I love you. <laughs> I love you, Mary Cashby. I love you. And Mary's like, well, that's probably about it. And Andy's like, okay. And Heather looks over at Mary. And Mary's like, well, I did like you, Heather, until I seen your interview. And Heather's like, what interview? Well, I see, I see you. You start talking about my house, like saying, this is gonna, if you get a tour of Mary's house and like making fun and we get a flashback to Heather visiting Mary's house and Heather's like, Mary's decor is exactly like Mary's personality. It dates its grandfather. No, she goes, you never quite know what you're going to get. Green carpet, Chanel pillows, Dr. Seuss chairs from Whoville. And Lisa's like, but you don't like that reaction to your house, but we are all fine with your reactions to us. And they're not nice. And this is the difference that Mary explains here. And I just want to explain this too, is that Heather says this shit in private, like talking heads. That's where Heather does a lot of her dirty work. Like her little comedic stylings is in the talking heads. Mary will say it to your face. And it's shocking because most people don't do that. Most people do this shit where they just talk behind your back. Mary's like, I don't see anything about you. What do I say about you, Miss Lisa? And Lisa's like, um, not this season, not this season. You didn't. And Mary's like, okay, then be quiet. And Lisa's like, no, I'm not going to be quiet. Tin roof rusted. And then he's like, with all due, you called Heather inbred. And Lisa's like, I know. So what's worse, your house comment or calling her inbred? And and we get a flashback to Heather at Mary's house where Heather's like, do you think I look inbred? And Mary's like, I do. <laughs> she has like this sweet smile on when she says it. It's so damning. And Mary's like, well, I think my house comment's worse. You do? I do. And Annie's like, you think what she said about your decor is worse than saying you look inbred and uh, saying that she looks inbred. And Mary's like, well, because she's phony. Like, don't come to my house and say, oh, this is so pretty. And that's true. Like, don't come and kiss my ass when you're just going to badmouth me to in private. Like, don't do that. And Heather's like, that's not phony. And Mary's like, is this a mansion? And Heather's like, I said your house was grand. I said it has elements that are unique, that are characteristic. It was like huge throne like chairs. And Mary's like, I'm just trying to, I mean, what I'm saying is, and Heather's like, we had a great time at your house. And Mary's like, well, I was in my house before this show. I don't need this to get like, you got your house after the show. <laughs> it's so funny. Lisa's like, who did? And Mary's like, you both did. And Lisa's like, oh, I did not. Mary, you don't know anything about me. So basically also, Mary's saying, I didn't need this show for money. Like, I, you got a fucking house because of this show. I already had this house. So say whatever you want. Heather goes, after my business and after my book, I got my house. You were proud of me for getting that house, Mary. <laughs> I'm like, Heather, you got it because of the show. You got the book because of the show. Give me a break. And he goes, 
what did you say about the house that bothers you? And Mary's like, well, she said it was like, she just made fun. They both made fun of me. And Heather's like, you're welcome to come to my house and make fun of my house. I was just commenting on what I saw and I was excited to be invited. And Lisa's like, if you came to my house, I'm sure you'd give your opinion about my house too. And Andy's like, you know, it's really interesting because you say everything to people's faces and it's shocking. And Mary goes, thank you, Andy. <laughs> and then he's like, well, I mean, and Mary's like, no, I'm saying thank you. And he's like, yeah. And Mary's like, cause I say it to your face. We get a flashback to various scenes with Mary blurting and saying things like, what made you wear that necklace? Or do you have a mute button? And Lisa's like, no, I don't. I'm always on. And Mary goes, well, you need to get one. And Lisa, I'm on play all the time. And then another scene with Mary and Monica, Mary going, you like to eat. You're a beautiful girl. Just don't eat your life away. And then, of course, the infamous, famous uh, wake up bobblehead to Whitney. And Andy's like, but sometimes you say kind of horrible things to people's faces. And Mary's like, well, they can say it back if they want to avoid each other's face. And Lisa's like, yeah, but we do. And then you say, I'm not talking to you anymore. And that's the end of the conversation. And Mary's like, why is she buttoning in? Who's talking to you? And Lisa's like, because it happened to me, because I'm a part of this. And Mary's like, what happened to you? Because like you say something horrible to me and then you don't like something I say. That's like not even that same magnitude. And then you're like, I'm not talking to Lisa. So, I mean, it's like, which by the way, Whitney said this about Lisa last episode when she said, Lisa will just like get into a fight and then not respond to anybody's text and just pull away. So you're complaining about your same behavior. And Mary goes, I don't know how she inserted herself in that. I don't know what she's talking about. And Lisa's like, I insert myself because I'm a housewife. That's another t-shirt right there. I insert myself because I'm a housewife. And he's like, well, she was responding as a member of this group because I'm saying that you say things to people's faces, you know? And uh, Mary's like, I know, but I think that's a good thing in this group that you say, I say it to their face. And he's like, yeah. And then when we say things to your face back, you don't say anything to my face. And he's like, I do. I do say exactly what I mean to your face. And Mary's like, okay, well, our relationship has been done. And Lisa's like, Exactly. So what? So what? And very, at least you can tell, is very proud of. It. She's like, I don't care about you anymore, Mary. It's kind of like when people stop believing in Freddy Krueger and Nightmare on Elm Street. Of like, I don't believe you in you anymore, Freddy. You're just a figment of my dreams. And then Freddy Krueger dies. You know? Okay, I'm almost done. I got the last little. Oh God, I feel like shit. You guys, ah, oh, I'm burning up. I'm the opposite of Meredith Marks. Andy, could you please turn the air up, please? I am so hot right now. So anyways, uh, we come back from break and he's like, let's talk about Robert Jr. Is he married or not? And Mary's like, well, they said they're married, but I still haven't seen that. You know, and he's like the paperwork. And we get a flashback of Mary asking her son, are you married? And he's like, I mean, kind of. Yeah. And then he's like, does he need to show you the paperwork? And Mary's like, to prove it, to prove that he's married. Yeah. And Andy's like, you don't believe him? And Mary's like, well, I can't even say it. Like, I'm like, get your girlfriend. Like, I keep calling her his girlfriend. So like, but maybe. This is another thing where I feel like we could find out real simple. In fact, I feel like we, the audience, could find out real simple. I'm sure some detective on Reddit has put this together, um, you know. And Andy's like, do you think he felt that he couldn't tell you that he was married? And Mary's like, of course, because I was ready telling him that this is not your wife. And Andy's like, do you think he's too young? And it turns out he's only 21 years old. And Andy's like, yeah, he is young. And Andy's like, well, how is it living with Robert Jr. and his wife? And Mary's like, well, I mean, about three months before we started filming, she moved in. And Andy's like, well, what made you think he would be bad in bed? And we get flashback to unseen footage of Mary getting glam done and the makeup artist going, how is your son, by the way? And, and Mary's like, he's good. He's always doing his own thing with his girlfriend. But um, I heard all this noise and I was going upstairs and the artist is like, what were they doing? And Mary's like, uh... And the makeup artist is like, oh, my God. And Mary's like, I said, oh, my gosh. I said, don't make my son think he's better than he is. Just stop doing all that. Stop playing. Stop it. Tell him the truth. This is the kind of hard love that you need from family of like, you are not good at fucking. You are not good at laying pipe. That is that is really that is that is, it's going to make her son strive to do better every <laughs> I mean, it's just truly insane. Mary's like, Andy, I don't think he was bad in bed. I just said, tell the wife, the girlfriend, stop pretending. Like, because I walk past that room and I hear all that noise and all this screaming and all this dramatic stuff. And I'm like, it's not that serious. Like, don't make, don't give him a big head and think that he's really like, you know, just like, you know, come on. Like, you know, because she was like, ah, ah. And I was like yelling. And I was like, what's wrong? And I was like, are they okay? And then I opened the door and that happened. And he's like, you opened the door. Well, kind of, but I got the point before I did. And then I don't know why i'm doing her as a southern lady I, I don't know why i'm doing it like this all this and he's like well if you got the point what was happening why would you open the door and mary's like i left i left and he's like okay i was scared and then he's like so you told her stop with the histrionics and mary's like be true to it like if it's all that then okay but if it's not don't make him think it is don't be faking it 
And then he's like, oh, okay. And Mary's like, yeah, that's all. And Lisa's like, oh my gosh. She's got a point though. But what if he is just a gift in the bedroom? What if, wh- I mean, why can't Mary even be open to the possibility that he is, this is his special thing. You, you never know. And then he's like, okay, so Whitney, how do you feel about having Mary back in the mix? And when he's like, you know, I was nervous. And Mary's like, Whitney is terrified of me for some reason. Yeah, because you bag on her every scene you have with her. And when he's like, no, no, I was grateful to have the opportunity to try to resolve things with her. I did not like how it ended this season prior. I felt bad because I wanted the opportunity to repair that. But you have to realize that everything that came out about you was not what we were saying. It was in the press. It was in the news. And Mary's like, that's not true. And I, like I said, there are a lot of things that came out about you guys, and I never ever did that. What you guys did to me, ever. And I've heard really horrible things about you. I'm sure you have, but I've never said that. And I won't because that's who I am. So remember that. That is an important thing to remember, is that Mary is outwardly bizarre, right? She is. Nobody argues that. And uh, done a really a lot of weird things with her religion, with her step-grandfather, a lot of things, you know. But you have to also remember that every one of these ladies, there's dirt on them as well. Uh, when he goes, okay, well, to answer your question, I was grateful to try to have the opportunity to repair with Mary. And Mary's like, I don't care, really. And Andy's like, Clark from Atlanta says, Winnie, do you realize how damaging it was to call Mary and Robert senior, senior predators season two? I bet Whitney was like, God damn it, Clark from Atlanta. Why did you do this? Uh, and he's like, did you mean sexually or that they engage in predatory behavior for financial gain at their church? We, the audience were left wondering, not okay. And when he's like, yeah, no, the predator thing for me probably is just my own trauma with being in a high demand religion. So I apologize for that. I don't think you're a predator, Mary. I'm not. And my husband isn't either. Never, never sexual ever. No. And then he's like, Whitney, you had some strong feelings. You tweeted, I cannot sit and listen to this evil and mean women, woman talk about growth. OMFG skull emoji. And we see flashbacks to Mary and Meredith talking and Mary's like, it just gets monotonous trying to give people chances. And you think you're going to go back into a crowd of people that are going to grow and they still haven't grown. I don't have that energy. I'm exhausted for these people. I need to see the change. And then he's like, tell me how you really feel. And when he's like, it's hard because I feel like I've personally put so much work into myself over the years. I mean, I've spent thousands of dollars on sound baths. Now she goes in therapy. I've been making a conscious effort to be a better person. And so for, you know, to see you talk about us that way, to see what you would say in your confessional about us. And Mary's like, so you're saying about what you're tweeting, call me, cursing me and call me names is growth. Is that what you're saying? I'm confused. And when he's like, well, I would have probably honestly never tweeted that had you not gone and tweeted about me. This, you know, if you get these housewives off Twitter, problem solved. We're not going to have any conflict at all. Just get them off Twitter. And Mary's like, I didn't tweet anything about you. I just said you were racist. I said you were racist. Yeah. I didn't tweet anything about you. I just said you were racist. I mean, it's not, it's, it's so bizarre that it makes you laugh. Cause you're like, Oh shit. Well, that's a big thing, Mary. And then he's like, well, I mean, if you tweeted that she's racist, when he's like, yeah. And Mary's like, yeah, I did. And then he's like, you believe that Winnie's racist. And you think Mary's going to be like, no. And she goes, I do a hundred percent. I do. It's kind of like the, do you think I'm in, do you think I'm in bread? I do. I really do. And when he's like, that breaks my heart, Mary. And Andy's like, based on what? And Andy goes like, I don't believe that. And Lisa's like, I don't believe it either. And Heather's like, well, I kind of believe it. No. And Mary goes, well, what they brought up, what they were brought up in. And Lisa's like, that's not true. And Mary's like, their religion, they were brought up in. Heather knows. And Andy's like, based on the religion. And when he's like, because of Mormonism. And Mary's like, mm-hmm. I believe that they have their beliefs. And Andy's like, okay. And they have that our color is cursed by the color of Cain. I don't believe that. Which, by the way, Lisa is also self-admitting to never having read the Book of Mormon or the Bible. So she's like, you really, you don't know. You really don't know. Mary's like, and that, we all will be in a different heaven. Our color, our skin color will be in a different heaven and we'll be the help. And that was taught. Mary has a point here, you guys. Whether you like her or not, that is, you know. And he's like, is that what Mormons believe? And Mary's like, and Heather can vouch for me. And Lisa's like, no, I'm Mormon. So can somebody ask me? I'd like to answer. And Heather's like, well, there is Mormon doctrine. It is rooted in racism. No, it's not. And when he's like, it is. And Heather's like, but the Mormon church today is making efforts on every level to outreach. But we, you know, we have to acknowledge it in order to change it. And Mary's like, thank you, Heather, for saying that. And Lisa's like, Thurry Bailey is black and a Mormon. And I think that's one of the, I don't know, bishops or something. And he's like, Whitney, you want to say what? And he's like, I just want Mary to know because that's a big accusation to make. And I am no longer a member of the Mormon church. And that was a part of my process for me. And Mary's like, well, I don't have anything against the Mormon church, Heather. (laughs) Now it's confusing because we've just established that the Mormon church is rooted in racism. And then Mary goes, I don't have anything against the Mormon church. 
<laughs> it's almost like Mary's like, I hate black people too. Like, it's so bizarre. And Lisa's like, well, I'm a Jewish Mormon. And Mary's like, I don't have anything against the Mormon church, Heather. And when he's like, I know, but you just said, and then he's like, well, you just said it's a racist church. And Lisa's like, yes. And when he's like, yeah. And Mary's like, right. But it doesn't mean I have anything against them. That's just their religion and that's their belief, but I don't have anything against them. And Whitney's like, but what have I done? And Mary's like, personally, I think we would. I wish we could just leave them alone. And Lisa's like, and that's fair, Mary. That part's fair. And Whitney's like, we're women of white privilege as well. So inherently, there are things that we have. And Whitney seems to really get it. She does. And Mary's like, go ahead and preach it, Whitney. You've been saying some good things lately. I have to say that. And Whitney's like, I've been learning, Mary. I've been learning. And Mary's like, go ahead. What? But I want to know personally, what have I done or said to you? And Mary's like, it's not anything you do or say. It's your actions. And it's a feeling. And you have to be my color to know it. And he's like, yeah, okay, that's fair. And Mary's like, it's not something that somebody could teach you. And when he's like, that's fair. And Mary's like, it's not something somebody can tell you. And when he's like, I just wanted to make sure. And Mary's like, that's the truth. And then he's, uh, by the way, as, as wild as this is, it's kind of a constructive uh, conversation. It kind of uh, is a helpful conversation in a sense. And when he is kind of understanding Mary's point, this is actually weirdly elements of actual communication happening right here. Um, so uh, when he goes, I, you know, I just want to make sure that I have not personally done or said anything to you of that nature. And then he's like, okay, well, that's important. Has she? And Mary's like, no, no. And when he's like, okay, thank you. When he did a good job of not blowing up and freaking out with that racist thing and talking through it and actually coming to a resolution. I thought that was actually positive because, you know, another character would have completely went batshit. And he's like, Mary, you weren't in Bermuda, but have you watched after you watched the finale? What did you think of that? What the women discovered about Monica? And we go back to Heather going, you are a fucking bully and a fucking troll. And you do not deserve to be at this table or anywhere near any of us by the way you've treated us. And Mary's like, well, I thought I was a little bit over the top. <laughs> I love it. I think Heather knew all season. And I think production knew as well. That would be great if Mary started saying that. Like, it was a little much with how they treated her and how they pushed her out. Especially no one was reflecting on themselves and what they went through. That was a little much because I have no idea who, whatever the troll account is, I don't. And Lisa's like, would you care if that account called you a dumb bitch? I'm just asking. And Mary's like, probably not. And Lisa's like, okay, you wouldn't care. I don't care. That wouldn't bother you? Okay. No, I get called everything on the internet. Just wanted to make sure. And Mary's like, like Twitter, they come for me hard. I just cut them off. And Monica's like, well, what if a good friend called another good friend a garbage whore who can go fuck herself? So Monica's throwing it back at Lisa because she knows what Lisa's about to do. And Lisa's like, oh, because you know you called Mary a dumb bitch. That's why you're speaking up. And then she goes to Heather, get the audio, get the tape, roll the tape. And Monica's like, no one called, no, I'm saying, come on. Yeah, get the audio from my best friend because you fucking bitches have nothing else to do. And Lisa's like, I didn't get anything from your best friend. I love Lisa's like, I didn't, Heather did. And Monica's like, yeah, the girl right there did. And Heather plays this audio clip of Monica going exactly why I called her a snake. Like you dumb bitch, like low key. I want to DM Mary from like a burner account. She probably wouldn't ever see it and be like, bitch, I could do it from reality Von Tees, Okay. But anyway, because we know she'd be watching that shit and she would open her messages. Now this is supposedly they're trying to say that she's saying this about Mary, but to me, it kind of almost reads like somebody said shit about Mary and she wants to give that information to Mary. Like, I, it almost feels like she is talking about somebody other than Mary, but wants to give that information to Mary, but not do it directly. Could be wrong. It's just how I was like, this doesn't, it, it seems a little out of context. And Mary's like, who? And Lisa's like, you, this is about you. And Monica's like, no, it's not. And what you're not going to do is play one side of something and make it look a certain way. No one said anything about Mary ever. And then he's like, what is that recording? And Heather's like, Monica, you said it. So and Monica's like, no. And Heather's like, why didn't you tell us what it is? And Monica's like, you're not going to play one 10 second clip. And Lisa to Mary goes, she called you a dumb bitch. And Monica's like, no, I did not shut your mouth. And Lisa's like, yes, she did. I'm not going to shut my mouth. It's your voice. And Heather's like, it's your voice. And Monica's like, you're not going to sit there. I was not talking about Mary. And then he's like, well, what is it? And Heather's like, oh, a different Mary? You're going to dump a DM from a burner account to a different Mary? And Monica's like, that is what Jen was saying about her. And you need to be playing all of those and the other person's side of where you got them from. And Heather's like, I don't need to play anything. And Lisa's like, you know how she snapped on this real quick because she knew it was something she said. And Monica's like, Lisa, seriously, stop. And like, this is what you said. And Monica's like, do you see what you guys are doing right now? And Lisa's like, no, I don't see. What are you doing right now? And Monica's like, what about me calling someone a dumb bitch? You've never called someone a dumb bitch ever, ever? And Lisa's like, not with your intentions. <laughs> There's like with a burner account, dump it in her DMs when you could do it as reality Von Tees. And Monica's like, Heather, shut the fuck up. Remember when Whitney, my favorite, I say this every Whitney was like, Heather, shut the fuck up. 
shut the fuck up, Heather. Shut the fuck up. Monica's like, Heather, shut the fuck up. And he's like, wow. And Monica's like, bleep, bleep is reality Von Tease. So they keep bleeping the one name. And I think it's Co- Kona or Koa or whatever. And Lisa's like, you're reality Von Tease. And Monica's like, it's like six people. It's six people, Lisa, which we went over last uh, reunion recap last week. And Lisa's like, it's not. And Heather's like, it's a full investigation, Monica. <laughs> Lisa's cyber squad is on it. And Monica's like, you don't know what you're talking about. Are you serious? And Meredith goes, does it really matter if it's one or six? Thank you for waking up, Meredith. And then he goes, okay, hold on, hold on. And Meredith's like, I want to say something. I want to say something. And then he's like, yes. And Mary goes, I feel like they should hear her out. No, sorry. This is not, this is Mary. She's like, I want to say something. I feel like they should hear her out. That wasn't Meredith. And then he's like, okay. And he's like, yeah. And Mary's like, I don't think they're letting her talk. Like they didn't give her a chance to say her side. And Mike's like, no, they didn't. And he's like, well, they're going to have to hear her out because we haven't discussed this issue yet. Oh, Andy, don't we know it? And Mary's like, okay. And he's like, but they're going to, because we are all anxious to hear what she has to say next week. The dramatic conclusion of the real housewives of Salt Lake city reunion. And he's like, explain to me how this works. And Heather's like, how, what works the internet? And Andy's like, no. And Heather's like, I just want to know what level we start at. Okay. Funny girl. And then Andy, and another scene going, Monica, we have not heard your story, side of the story about Bermuda. And then Monica pulls out the burn book, which is kind of lame. And everybody's like, oh my God. And then another scene where Lisa's like, you were stalking Jen. And Monica's like, I did not stalk Jen. You did on multiple occasions. And Monica's like, no one is stalking Jen. You have four kids at home and you're a single mother with no income. And Andy's like, do you have proof that she stalked Jen? And Lisa's like, yes, we do. And then another scene where Andy's like, you set up Jen's security cameras? And she's like, yes. You had the ability to watch Jen in her home and see what she was saying. And Monica's like, yeah. And Meredith goes, you told me you had evidence. And Monica's like, no. And Heather's like, are you accusing her of lying? And then Angie K going, I'd rather sit her than sit here than sit there and be a rat out of the fucking sewer. And we do know that about the mafia and the Greek mafia, they hate rats. And then Andy in another scene goes, is it too insurmountable for you guys to move on as a group? And then Monica going, Heather can hate me all she wants. That's fine. But she and I went through the same exact trauma, which I think she's meaning the relationship with Jen. And then finally we have Andy, Jen gave you the black eye to Heather. And Heather's like, yeah. And Andy goes, tell us how it happened. And that is the end. I want to say something really quickly too about context. Now those clips, they're damning, right? But there is something about context. You've got to understand the context of of a situation. Um, Things can be damning all the time, but then you find out the context of the situation, the surrounding things, and it fills in a lot of the blanks. We've got to wait to find out some of the context before we just jump. Um, And by the way, you could find out the context and Monica could still be completely wrong, but we do have to find it out. It's easy to cherry pick things or events from a certain time or a certain thing and go, okay, this fits the narrative I'm trying to build, trying to build this case. So I'm going to cherry pick these things. But we've got to actually try to find out the whole story. Monica is still guilty regardless, but it's going to help fill in those blanks and it's going to make it a little bit more where we can be like, okay, I see the roadmap. I see how we got to where we are today. Uh, That's it, folks. Uh, Sorry if this didn't make tons of sense. I feel completely out of it. I'm going to go knock myself out, take a test, uh, a COVID test, and hopefully get better. I love you guys. Uh, Hopefully I will be better and I'll be doing the Beverly Hills reunion for Friday and I will talk to you very, very soon. Goodbye.